it's gonna be one of 20 else's. Are you two done? Come on. She's six. You're only six months. This is so exciting. This is so exciting. Welcome. It's nice to have such a, a nice large crowd. Uh, welcome to the October 20th, 2014 school committee meeting. Uh, we have a rather uh, packed agenda tonight. Um, there's typically extra packets out front. If you guys have them, hopefully you can share. If you don't, but it's kind of thick, so I don't know how many we printed. Okay. Um, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start this evening with public input, like we always do. I would only ask that if there's public input that isn't on the agenda, please feel free. Um, and for those parents that are concerned about MCASTs and, 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 and that conversation, a reminder that that meeting is November 3rd and we've moved it to Coolidge to accommodate uh, what might be a larger crowd. So we should have maybe planned ahead tonight, but it looks like everyone has a seat. So if there's public input that's not on tonight's agenda, you're more than welcome to come up and talk. Welcome. I'll start it off. Please. I'm Mary Ann Downing. You welcome. no doubt know me. I'm a parent of second and fourth graders at Joshua Eaton. And just further to MCAS, the only thing I want to say is what, something I'd like to see next month. So this is directed to Craig Martin and Dr. Darty. Um, as, as I considered um, the presentation Ms. Feeney gave a few weeks ago at Joshua Eaton, one thing that struck me that I wish I'd asked, and maybe you guys can analyze, is was there um, in the report cards that these students who scored below the percentile, what, was there a correlation between their MCAS grades and their actual grades on their report cards? Could we have seen this? Maybe our teachers need more training in standards-based grading. Maybe there needs to be more precision in the report card. So that's just my only thought. If someone could take a look at that by next month, that would be great because I think it would be helpful to parents moving forward. So. Um, I'll leave most of my MCAS comments to that month. I have, do have one comment of something on the agenda tonight um, with full day kindergarten and school crowding. The two questions I have are why is there going to be any thought to using school buses, meaning give the superintendent a three mile, you know, more than a two mile option to alleviate space issues. As I looked in the presentation ahead of time, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm focusing on Joshua Eaton because that's where my kids go. But, you know, Joshua Eaton has 30 more kids than the next highest school, Killam, but two fewer classrooms. And even though Joshua Eaton only has two more classrooms than Woodend, it has 135 more students. One would think it would be, you know, around 50 more kids, not 135. I mean, as my research said that Wood End was built to hold 400 kids and has 334 or 336. So I think busing is cheaper than a new building. I think, you know, the large class sizes at, and crowding at Joshua Eaton may or may not be contributing to an MCAS differential. So I'd just like to see that, an analysis of those costs and um, whether they might be relevant to um, improving the situation. And just one last point, I don't know I don't know if these are kids that happen to live across the street from Joshua Eaton, but it isn't just the kindergartners going there. My son's fourth grade class grew from 88 to 91, and they didn't have to go to Joshua Eaton, whoever those three kids were, unless they were an LLD. And Reading Commons and Reading Woods are more than three miles from Killam, so something, I say bring back the buses. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Downing. Um, I'm going to hold off on responding to those questions until we actually have the full day kindergarten conversation. Sure. But, okay. But thank you very much. More? Sure. Oh, welcome. Hi, I'm Eileen Manning, and I also am a Joshua Eaton parent and have a third and fourth grader. And was also at the MCAS presentation uh, back at Joshua Eaton. And I appreciate the efforts that the administration and the school went through to dig through the data and you know help present to us some findings and you know what exactly <coughs> was going on with the scores. I'm a bit concerned with the current action plan. Um, I, I'm not convinced it goes far enough to reverse that trend that we're seeing in the math scores and in the science scores. There's you know those three specific areas of the math overall and the fourth grade specifically the high needs kids and the science scores. And what we saw in the action plan, I think, was relatively high level. We'd like and hope that we'll see some more detail in that in the next presentation. 
you know, I assume there is a plan for further intervention, you know, beyond sort of that implementing of the math curriculum and the math tutors. And we hope that as that plan is formalized, that all of our, all of our stakeholders, you know, be it the administration, the teachers, the school committee, and the parents will have some input into that process. Okay. So I, some of what I would like to see in that action plan is that we have steps that are able to be measured so that we can show some interim progress to know that we are moving towards our goals, that we have a way to communicate to parents in a timely manner so that they can take action when appropriate, and that we have a transparent process that will include all those stakeholders, and that we're able to adjust our learning processes along the way. So I look forward to those collaborative meetings that I know are scheduled for Joshua Eaton or soon to be on the books, and I ask that the district is ready to actively respond to what comes from those meetings. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nitty. Do you have a comment? I, I, I actually do, and I, I also would like Mrs. Uh, Feeney to talk as well. Sure. Um, so I, I think, you know, to, to answer your, your question, I think there is this perception, because I've, I've heard it a few times now, that um, both the district and administration are not doing anything. And I, I want to assure everyone that there's been a lot of things going on behind the scenes. I mean, Karen can to attest to the amount of hours that central office administration has been spending over at Joshua Eaton, meeting with her, meeting with teachers, um, and already beginning the process of, of taking a look at what, what needs to happen. We've already started putting things into place. I'll, you know, I'll, ju I'll just give you some information that you know 50 percent of the title one money is going to eaton this year which is fifty three thousand dollars that fifty three thousand dollars is going to tutoring support which we're in the process of hiring those tutors um it's going to professional development it's going to for the title one math teacher language arts teacher that's going to be spending at least half her time <coughs> over at joshua eaton um so that's already happening that's already in place there's going to be um, tutoring opportunities both before and after school. Um, our goal is to make sure that every student that at no charge, our goal is to make sure that every student that needs it will get it and we're coming up with a way to do that. Um, the, other, the other thing that I think is important is that we also have to follow some state guidelines in terms of the planning and in the letter I sent out to everyone um, there was some links to the, uh, the state accountability site there's something called a DSAC. We are actually having our first meeting with the DSAC tomorrow. Um, the DSAC helps us create the action plan and provides resources on how to do that. Um, so that's all happening behind the scenes. So the things that we can do right now, we're doing. The things that require more long-term planning, um, we, we're using the DSAC to help us with that. So there's a lot happening behind the scenes. I know Ms. Feeney's also been communicating through her blog and we'll continue to do that. Um, I know she also has some things that she wants to say about things that are gonna be happening um, as well. So I don't know if you wanna, I don't know if you wanna come up here. Or that's okay. Welcome, Mrs. Feeney. Hi. Nice to have you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we have been working diligently to address the situation of the level three at Joshua Eaton, and we've been um, working with the staff to complete the assessment tool that is provided by the state in order to identify areas in which we do need to address to improve student learning and teacher practice to be able to make sure that we're um, taking a comprehensive look at, at all of the areas that we need to be doing. We're also using our school advisory council um, which has a meeting next week actually on Monday to be able to identify through the use of the assessment tool as well ways that we can have parent input on how they feel things are going um, and there was an introduction to that at our first meeting um, however it is pretty pretty comprehensive so we didn't get too far in the process but we'll continue that again next week as we move forward with that and um, as Dr. Darty mentioned, we do have the use of the, um, the principal's blog that I'm setting that I have already in place. And we have the 
um, Twitter link too, and we will be creating um, a Facebook page for the Joshua Eaton community um, so that this way we will be able to then share out information in a variety of ways so that parents can have access to a transparent way of seeing what the process is. One of the things that um, Mrs. Manning mentioned that we are looking forward to be doing is having open meetings for parents at Joshua Eaton so that we can hear their input, hire get an idea of what their main concerns are, where the, our focus should be, get their input on ways that we will be able to move forward collaboratively. That is the key <coughs> component and something that I've said all along that we need to have teachers, parents, and staff and um, community on board so that we can move forward in a very positive direction for this. Um, also looking at the ways that we can use our paraeducators and our tutoring staff that are currently in place, use them in a different way to make sure that we are continuously supporting students in their learning during the day, and then find ways to support that after school as well, or before school, depending on the availability that, and the needs of parents and teachers. So that this way, we're looking at the greater needs of all of our students um, and making sure that we are addressing concerns <coughs> for everyone. So we have been very actively involved and as Dr. Dardy mentioned tomorrow we'll be meeting with the DSAC to hopefully come up with um, the, s the stages and the phases of how we need to implement our plans so if I can piggyback on that I I think this is beyond an MCAS issue and I, and I think we we can't just focus on MCAS in this conversation this this conversation has to focus on it, it gives us an opportunity to look at the entire school and to use use our assessment tool with the community in a way that we could say, okay, what are the things that are working? What are the things that aren't working? And what can we do to improve all things? I don't think we should be focusing just on MCAS. I think that is a, a mistake. Um, MCAS is not the only tool that we use to assess how our schools are doing. So the, the things that we need, and we need to get all the stakeholders input, including parents, kids. I'd like to know what kids think, and I know that Karen does in the teachers well. We need to get teacher input, certainly, um, in the community. So the school council <coughs> will be the steering group, but I would envision, and Karen and I and Craig have talked about this, is that there's going to be a task force from the school council that's going to take a look at this, and it's going to be a mix of stakeholders in that task force that's going to use a tool to assess what's working, what's not working, and how can we make it better. Because we need this to be sustainable. We could put quick fixes in that solve MCAS issues, but is that really what we want? I think what we want is that we want to make sure that kids really are truly learning and understand what's going on, and that we want our schools to be the best they can be. So that's the whole purpose of the, the long-range planning, and that's what we're doing right now. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Thank you, Mrs. Feeney. Okay. Don't go too far. <laughs> 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 More public input? Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Sherry Vandenacker. I'm a Joshua Eaton parent as well. And um, I have one question first, which is, will the self-assessment be available publicly? Will, will we be able to check that out? In, in the results of the actual tool? Or both. <laughs> the, yeah, the results, like what the school came up yes, with, because it's, it's been completed. So No, no, everyone's going to be, uh, we're going to have, the staff has started doing it. Okay. But we need to include other stakeholders as part of that process. All right, I I'm, I'm misunderstood what right. Ms. Feeney had on her blog then. No. I thought she had said it was complete and you were moving to phase two. So The, the staff had done some work okay. on the self-assessment tool, but now the, the discussion has to happen. Okay. Great, and so it will be available publicly. Great, and then the other is, I think, it, you know, obviously I'm a big supporter of the collaborative approach. Um, the school council, I believe, has what, three parents on it, maybe? Um, three? We actually have five. Five? So it meets at three o'clock on a Monday afternoon. I, I'm not sure that's the most, and is it's constant, as it's constituted now and as it meets now and how inactive I think it's been over the years if that I think if that group is going to spearhead um, this movement we need to kind of maybe look at uh, a more robust process or group thanks thank you very much hmm. more public input 
Welcome, come on up. Hi, I'm Gina Martin. I'm also a Joshua Eaton parent. I'll keep this brief um, because I do have some concerns um, regarding um, the improvement plan and I've um, emailed um, Dr. Doherty, Mr. Martin, and Ms. Feeney. Um, but one suggestion I have with respect to communication is the principal's blog. Why don't we tie that to the headline, which I don't think it has been yet. Um, the actual like, link? Yeah, like yeah. Your, you can get to your blog mm -hmm. from the website. I think Absolutely. that would be very helpful in parents That's knowing when something's one. been posted. Thank you. <laughs> wow. If they could all be like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there more public input this evening? Because we're going to get started here. I know we are. Good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on, we'll start with reports from our student reps. Mr. Gillies? Oh. Go ahead. I, I should have went ladies first. I'm sorry, but go ahead. You can go. All right. So um, something today, the top six members of the golf team went to the state tournament, um, an upcoming event put together by the HIV Awareness Club. Um, if you eat at Fresh City um, in the upcoming week, it will support HIV awareness. And the football <coughs> team will be competing for a share of the Middlesex League title this Friday. Thank you. Um, this Friday from 6 to 8.30, the Drama Club will be putting on their yearly um, Haunted House Shocktoberfest. Um, I'm involved in it. It's the theme this year is Myths and Legends. So it should be really spooky. So you should stop by Friday night. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Where? Um, in the Performing Arts Center. Uh, also, this past Sunday, the Terrazine Gala was in Boston. And I heard that some students from high school went, and they really enjoyed it. I heard really good things about it. Um, also, a good thing is the bell, our victory bell at RMHS, has arrived. It is here. It has not been um, displayed yet, but um, I've seen some pictures of it. It looks really cool. I really am a fan of the bell. I think it brings some school spirit to the school, and I really like it. So that's my update. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, Mrs. Browski. Mr. Chair, last Tuesday the Recreation Committee met, but we were not able to achieve quorum. So it's a very quick meeting. Um, but I do have two quick updates from um, some folks over in Recreation. First of all, um, last Tuesday there was an in-service day for teachers in the district, and the Recreation Department ran some very nice programs. Some children um, hiked Blue Hills, there was a Lego workshop, and there was also dodgeball. So there were a, a host of very nice events that were very successful from the Rec Committee or the Rec Department. Also, next not next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday, October 29th from 4 to 5.30, there is the first annual downtown trick-or-treat, which sounds amazing. I think over 35 businesses have already opened, and there are going to be upwards of 60, they think. They haven't even reached out to everybody. Um, town Hall is going to be completely open, so you can bring your trick-or-treaters through Town Hall, and all the departments will be giving treats. The police station will be open. Um, businesses will be identified by a balloon, so it'll be really easy to know. It sounds like an incredible event. They are looking for adult volunteers. So I said I would certainly ask the school committee if anyone was available <laughs> on that day. Didn't realize there'd be a room full of adults. <laughs> so any adult is available on um, Wednesday, October 29th. They need volunteers in the morning to help set up, and then volunteers at the event from 4 to 5.30. That is my opinion. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Kind of going right to left. Oh. Yeah. Of I do. I actually have two reports. Andrea um, mentioned a little bit about the Terrazin Music Foundation Gala. A um, uh, group from the choral department at the high school went. I want to thank the Terrazin Music Foundation <coughs> for donating the tickets to that event. It was quite incredible in terms of um, you're, it was at Symphony Hall, and there were many survivors surrounding us. We actually got the best seats in the house, front row of the balcony, overlooking, and they did an amazing job juxtaposing real footage of the Nazi propaganda film of um, the musicians who played in Terrazin with the pianist and the string quartet, str it wasn't a quartet, sorry, the string group, and also the Boston Children's Choir sang. Um, and they had, the final piece was Brundabar, which was an opera, 
that was sung in Terezin by the children, to the children, and to the international community to convince the international community about how well the Jews were being treated in Terezin. And they juxtaposed it with the Nazi propaganda film showing the children singing. Then two of the survivors who had been in that performance as children in Terezin came out and sang with the Boston chorus. And we think that she must, one of them was singing in Czech um, because her lips weren't matching what the children, but it was incredibly powerful. And that's, the students came away and the, we all just had goosebumps because the um, two survivors that were singing, Michael Brumbaum and I can't remember her name, forgive me please, Ari something. Um, they were singing and they were holding hands the whole time and they held their hands up in the victory symbol like the final solution didn't work. And I think it was really important and the students got to meet with two survivors who have come and visited the Reading schools right after the concert and Kristen Killian enabled this to happen along with the Munganas. Um, and it was just an incredible experience. So I'm sorry for going on about it, but I think it's something they will and I will remember forever. Um, I also, on a quicker note, um, attended the Parker MCAS meeting, which I really was, um, I was impressed because I really love that there are invested parents who are interested, engaged, <coughs> doing research, having great questions, and we're all trying to understand and have this be a catalyst for good change for moving forward and learning about what's going on in the schools. And I think that's always good because nothing stands still. So I was really honored to be a part of that group that met that night um, and listening to Doug Lyons present it with a mix of media to explain the MCAS and the growth, um, the growth measurements and that kind of thing. So I won't go on and on, but um, so those are my reports. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Mrs. Webb? The further left. <laughs> Yes. Way down there. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, basically, it's not a report, but two announcements. So this week, uh, Rokasa, uh, both Mr. Robinson and I are on the board of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. And on the 23rd, we have a really important community dialogue. It's actually um, multiple communities. Rep, uh, State Senator Jason Lewis will be there as well as some of our other reps. It's at the Field House, and it's a World Cafe style dialogue which is sort of uh, group, groupings and regroupings, small group table discussion, and you, there's a process by which the input and feedback is harvested. And it's a very important discussion on the opioid abuse issue, and I really encourage um, not just the folks who are sitting here today that I can look at, but anybody in our community who's watching us on TV, great TV we are, and uh, really encourage people to attend that, and I just really wanna encourage people that it doesn't really matter how old or how young your children are opioid abuse issue is something that um, impacts us at all in any age really so I really want to encourage people in that dialogue and encourage for parents of maybe teenagers or young people if they're home um, it would be great to have some of our young people our high school students our Rakasa youth crew and the youth um, Rakasa youth club but we really need young people as part of this dialogue because we can't, we're too old to get inside your heads. And we need, we need that um, feedback there so that we can make decisions that are gonna be the ones that are gonna save kids. And um, so it's a really important issue. And I just really encourage people to try to put that on your calendar. And I just wanna add one thing, I don't wanna conflict with Mrs. Sprowski's town. I'm very excited about the Halloween thing, but it's, um, <coughs> That's also a financial forum, unless the town decides to reschedule that. October 29th is financial forum meeting. And, next Wednesday. right. It's next Wednesday. Right, which is okay. when yeah. the. Different, different times, times, though. Oh. You can go yeah. to both. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Because if people don't know what the financial forum is about, this is a, a meeting. It's usually it's chaired by the um, FinCom, correct? Yeah. The FinCom, the Board of Selectmen, School Committee. Um, many town departments, staff, the um, school superintendent, police chief, fire chief. It's really where our community comes together to have a dialogue about our town budget. <coughs> and all of the great things that we want to do for our schools or with our other municipal resources and services, we can only do if we can sign a check that cashes. 
and that's what the financial forum is about. It's about how do we have that dialogue to enable us to understand what the decisions, the hard decisions are going to be um, as we go forward into the next year and make sure that, um, you know, the checks that we're signing are the ones that are giving us the best impact and doing the things for this community that we want done. So I encourage all community members, budget parents from our schools, um, especially uh, the budget parents would be a great opportunity. Um, maybe some of the folks who are involved in the um, um, early childhood space needs issue, these are important discussions. And this is the second or third financial this is forum? Three. 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 So there'll probably be at least one more before we get into um, a weekly or bi weekly, every other week budget meeting. So that's thank it. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Doherty, do you have a report this evening? I, I do not at this point because it's still be. No. Any other members? <laughs> Good. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Dory, we're going to now get into, uh, we're going to go right directly into new business, if that's okay. Um, do you have a preference, Dr. Dory? You sure? Maybe Josh Wheaton. I was going to say Josh Wheaton first because yeah. Mrs. Feeney is here. Yep. I'm ready to go and excited and all stretched out. So Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome. Come on back up, Mrs. Feeney. Yep. Dr. Dory, do you want to... Uh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Makes me a little nervous. Um, we gave an update on the process that we had gone through with writing. And so this year, what we're looking at is how the MTSS process, the Mass Tiered Systems of Support, is helping our students at Joshua Eaton, and what are the benefits of that for both social and academic components. So, let's see. All right. It's not working. At all. So, oh, thank you. Oh, no. um, so this this summer we worked with our um, oh, our MTSS yeah. leadership team, and we were able to redefine mind. our vision statement that we have. And we really looked at focusing on four real qualities that we're looking for students to have displayed during their their time here at school, and hopefully carry over into their home lives and their social skills as well. So we changed our vision statement this year to changing it to Jaguars make all things possible by, um, as we are the Jaguars, um, by practicing compassion, acting responsibly, working towards success, and showing respect. So these are the areas that we were really looking at to be able to help students. So what we're going to look at is how this MTSS process helps us with student achievement in a, very, in a few areas. So working with MTSS, um, we help make sure that we're addressing their social and emotional needs. So we're looking at the whole child, not just the academic components that, that they display on a daily basis. We are supporting students also with their academic needs, helping us to identify behaviors, positive and ones that may need a little redirection and then also using our SST time and data meetings to be more productive for teachers in their time so that we're able to identify students that may need supports or students that may need to also be challenged in some areas. So when we're looking at what we did in regards to the behavioral component, we took a look at redefining a behavioral matrix that we had. Um, in the past, we used one that went by color-coded, so we were looking at red, yellow, and green behaviors to identify the way that students were, were di displaying their behaviors. We actually recreated that, and I'll get to that slide in a minute, to make it more aligned to what we are asking students to be doing in regards to pause. Um, we kicked it a little bit of old school and went back to the basics and actually took time this year to be able to teach what we were expecting students to be doing. It, came up through conversations of our staff that there are some things that we ask students to do that we ever we never really taught them how to do. So going over what does quiet in the hall look like? What is respectful behavior really look like all the time? We can say to a student, you know, be respectful or make sure you're showing respect, but do they actually know what that looks like and do they actually know how they can be doing that while they're in school? 
We took time to go over cla uh, cafeteria behaviors and do they know how to line up to buy lunch? Do they know how to buy milk where it's in with the lunch line and what is the process for actually doing that? Um, what, what happens when an adult is talking in the cafeteria? What is their role at that time? So really taking time to show them all the ins and outs of the school. We did the classroom as well. We take for granted during the day that they know where the glue sticks are in a classroom, but every year glue sticks are in another part in a new classroom, so they may not know that. Um, and the hopes of this was that by taking the time during the beginning of the school year, we would be able to then remove some of the interruptions that may come along with learning of redirecting students to, oh no, the glue sticks are in the back corner, or remember we're walking quietly in the hall, that it's now becoming embedded in our day-to-day -day routine. When we're looking also at the behaviors, we look at strategies for teachers to be able to use and to implement in their, in their classroom routine. And then we also had developed a pause and think sheet. So the Jaguar theme runs thick in our building. So here is a copy of what we use for our behavioral matrix. And so up at the top, it identifies the areas in which we're asking students to display these behaviors. So we have the classroom specialist and assemblies, hallways, the playground, and the school grounds, the cafeteria, and believe it or not, even the bathroom. Really making sure we covered all our bases to have um, all of our areas covered in their school. So we developed as a team, the MTSS team, looking across and what do we mean when we're practicing compassion? What are some of the behaviors that you're actually displaying if you are practicing compassion while you're in the classroom? So one of them is comforting others. And what does acting responsibly look like when you're walking in the hallways while well, you're walking silently so you're not disrupting the other learning that's going on? Um, working towards success when we are looking at um, what that looks like. We are helping each other, we are having fun um, out on the playground, we're making new friends and being able to be supportive. And even in the cafeteria when we're looking at that, we're enjoying our lunch and making sure we're eating it too. That always becomes a problem. They get so caught up with all their talking time that sometimes we forget that part. And then looking at showing respects to some of those, um, you know, for the bathroom, that might be a little one that some may think that's a little tricky, but you know, giving privacy to your friends. Um, using a quiet voice while you're in there, they echo an awful lot, and, they, and they're a lot of fun when you're <laughs> having when you're in there. So making sure that we're um, using those appropriately. So these were some of the ways that we identified behaviors, and you know it's a work in progress. So we can always go back if we find that there are things that were not on there or things that should be on there um, that aren't, and being able to add and subtract to the behavioral matrix with that as well. Our pause and think sheet is one that we really want students to just be reflective of things that they're doing during the day. And so we took some opportunity to look at what we called our reflection form before, um, where students were able to think about different things that they did um, that maybe wasn't on task for their learning at that particular time. So we came up with our pause and think sheet. And again, looking at the behaviors that go along with pause, and really giving them that ownership. Everything that we're doing is going back to reinforcing all of those four categories that we have. Um, one of the things that I really liked that we added on was, well, the class was, and they're supposed to identify what the class was doing, and then indicating maybe what they weren't doing at that particular time. So they can, as themselves, identify what it is that may have been a, a bad choice at that particular moment that they're able to regroup and to move on at that time. One of the things that we're really working on with our school is to make sure that this is one that this sheet is used as something to think about and not necessarily a negative agitation to it so that this way we're being able to take that opportunity to think about things and to be reflective of how we're supposed to be when we're in school. And consequences for their behaviors could be you know, how they're making other people feel and how their behaviors have impacted other students. And really looking at consequences not always being taking something away for a student, but being able to have them identify different ways that they may have affected someone else's learning at that time. So as a form of positive recognition, what we do is we identify students and we have them get spotted. And it's our equivalent of caught being good. 
And again, you see that we are looking at the four components of practicing compassion, acting responsibly, working towards success, and showing compassion. And the teachers are able to circle or highlight which area it is, and then identify what it is that that child did at that particular time to get spotted. And so what we do at the beginning of every day is to read a few spots over the loudspeaker during our morning announcements, and so that students have that ability to hear and to identify what role model of behavior we're looking for throughout the school. At our monthly assemblies, we identify students that have been spotted. They get their opportunity to stand up in front of the whole school population and get a nice round of applause from their peers. And then what we do instead of the perfect attendance award, because that is one that's tricky for kids in the younger grades, they can't help but get sick at some opportunities. So we do the Spot Hall of Fame, and we look at the number of students get, that get the most individual spots throughout the school year. And we keep track of that in the office so that this way we're able to identify the students. And outside of the cafeteria, on their way out to the playground, there are two bulletin boards that hang high, and all of the paw prints in that, those two bulletin boards have students' names that have achieved the highest number of spots throughout the school year. So it is a great motivator for students. They love it. They're very um, excited to come into the office to let us know that they've gotten spotted. They ask for their stickers, which they get, um, and says, I've gotten spotted. So it's a nice little way for them to be recognized for their positive behavior. And we use positive. <laughs> so one of the ways that we use the MTSS intervention system that we have um, is through our SST meetings and SST is our student support team and what this is is our grade level teachers that meet every six weeks and this is an opportunity for them to meet with their the reading specialist the school psychologist some special ed staff and they're able to look at data to be able to identify students that may be struggling or students that may need some challenging work and, as well and to be able to use that time to come up with plans for how we're going to use interventions and what are we going to do to see if there are times for students <coughs> to have some interventions in place and are they going to make progress and it could be something of having a paraeducator or a tutor come in and help support and review some trick words during the day or to have some <coughs> words be reviewed with them or some math facts as well as we know the um, basic facts are ones that may be a little bit tricky for students as well so getting them that time to use that and so again this is an every six week cycle so some of the data that we have been looking at especially at the upper grades is to look at some of the MPS data as Dr. Doherty mentioned this is just one component we also use Dibble scores and the Fontes Pinnell benchmark assessments to be able to use student data as well as end of the um, unit assessments that teachers give for either foundations or for the math program um, to be able to identify where there may be some weaknesses. What we do with this is when we're looking at our data in a form like this, we're able to identify the strand and the topic that students may be showing some vulnerability in. And we're able to then come up with some ideas collaboratively on how we can address these concerns. And that's what some of that time is designated for. So we're able to then go back and to implement these strategies to see, and this is where we progress monitor students to see the effectiveness of the um, strategies that we're putting into place. Again, this is just another way of showing where we're looking at some of the um, areas that we may need to be looking at. This is current fifth grade um, English language arts data and really looking to see where we may have some gaps. Um, we have identified already in both areas that open response is an area that we do need to focus on for both math and ELA. And when looking at the math component, we have identified that fractions, measurement, and data are also some components that we need to be working on. And the lower grades have already identified that the basic math facts, adding and subtracting, are the areas that we focus some additional time <coughs> on as well. So we do look at student growth as well. As we know, we're looking to get into the top quadrant for the high growth, high achievement. And this would be our math for grades four and five. Um, as we know, third grade does not have the student growth as that's their baseline data that is collected at that year. 
And so we're looking at ways that we can really help students to achieve and to move forward in these areas of growth. And the same with their ELA scores. You can see we're, we're moving along, we're trekking through this. Um, so we use this as ways that we can help identify areas that we may need to improve. So the MTSS comes into play where we look at how we tier the students. There are three tiers of support that we look at, and this is something for all students. They are not necessarily special education students or ELL <laughs> students or students that meet the criteria for Title I. Um, these are for all of our students, all of the learners at Joshua Reed. So the top tier are the students that need that additional, that additional challenge, the ones that we're really identifying as exceeding the standards and finding those ways to continue to have them keep learning. Our tier two is where we're looking at our, I'm sorry, I have that, re I have that reversed, I'm sorry. <laughs> tier three is the ones where we need a little bit more academic concern, I'm sorry about that. Um, and so we're looking at those students to see what supports we can put in place to help them. And then we're looking at tier two as the ways that we may need to just have some short-term intervention. In term, uh, tier two can be both, all of the tiers can be either academic or social and behavioral. So those usually are the students where those short-term interventions that we put into place within the, the general ed classroom are the ones that really do help us to move forward and to show them that they're able to, um, just with that extra support, get that boost that they need. And then at the tier one is where we're looking at all of our students to hopefully be at. And those are the ones that can access the general ed curriculum with little or no support from outside services, just teacher direction, and they're able to access that. And the tier one is where we do want the majority of our students to be. We do understand that there will be some that will fall into tiers one and two, and tiers two, I'm sorry, tiers two and tier three, and that we are going to look at the ways that we can better help provide them the services that they need. So here is another um, breakdown of all of that. So the ter ter tier two, sorry, um, again, is that short-term interventions that we're looking for. So giving them that little extra dose. And tier three is more of the long-term interventions that we need to be providing for students. Tier three does not always mean special education. We can have special education students in our tier two supports. Um, tier three just may look a little different for the um, way that the students need to access either the school day or the academic curriculum that we have in place. And so how does this help us? Well, teachers can spend time on instruction rather than on redirecting behavior. It's one of the hopes that students are identified and we're able to give them the supports that they need. Um, teachers use best practices and share supports with each other to be able to identify ways that they can help create a classroom environment that is more supportive of all of the learners. And then we're hoping that this now will give us the opportunity to have parents receive more accurate information about their child's progress. And so that is one of the goals that we've added for, for this year to really make sure we're transparent in the information we're sharing. So our next steps, and this is for the entire school, is to be um, adding the math support that we have coming our way through the Title I funding. Uh, we will be having math tutoring both before and after school and also during the school day. We will have the math coach come in and we're also looking at having the math and focus trainers come back to our school to be able to work with our teachers to give them some more um, training and professional development around the implementation of the math program. We actually sent seven of our teachers to other districts on the October 14th day where we were able to have them go and observe teachers actually implementing the program um, that, uh, that have had more experience using the math and focus um, program. So it was a great day that they got a lot coming back from that. Um, a lot of great ideas generated from there. Our professional learning communities, which are happening at the district level and at the building level, will be able to have time for teachers to meet with either grade level colleagues within our building or across the district, which always lends to very valuable conversation. Again, on that October 14th day, it was excellent to hear all of the teachers having that opportunity to talk to one another and to be able to share um, best practices and get some insights on ways that we may do some things differently. We have um, teachers that will be visiting other teachers' classrooms, even within our own classroom, our own school, excuse me, and then using the Title I supports. 
And so this is just a little slide that I thought a quote for um, showing that collaboration is going to be the key to help moving us forward in all areas, both the social and emotional needs and also the academic concerns that we may have um, for our students. So that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Comment? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm a strong supporter of the MTSS system. And um, I, I do think that sometimes in the presentation, it comes across maybe as a negative when you're talking about addressing student behaviors. But I think it's really important for people to understand that creating a learning environment is really paramount in terms of a, a really strong educational uh, experience uh, happening. S student social, emotional, well-being, bullying, things of that nature. Um, can really infect uh, their performance at school and it can not just doesn't necessarily just affect the individual that may be having some social emotional issues it can be their friends that are now concerned about them um, someone who may be the uh, aggressor in a bullying circumstance um, so I, I commend you for that um, another um, the SST student support team one thing that I noticed when I was looking over your PowerPoint this afternoon was that um, I understand where I'm coming from. I was a physical education health educator and also the director of applied arts in Damas Public Schools. So one thing that seems to sometimes get left behind are those teachers in terms of getting them um, uh, involved in understanding the needs of, of students because they see them on a regular basis and um, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for them to, the teachers that is, to understand um, the needs of their students, whereas they don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do see them periodically. So it does sometimes take a while for them to, to know where kids are coming from. And then one question I do have is, when, when your students are going to be getting the additional support in math, where, where will that, during the school day, when will that take place? Would that be during? During their classroom and their math instruction. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Nice job. Dr. Doxa. Sorry. He asked me first. Sorry. I have two questions. Um, thank you, first of all, for this comprehensive presentation. It's been a lot on all of your plates, and I appreciate this. The time you've taken, and I, too, am really interested in this MTSS process. Um, one of the questions I had was about the SST. So you said that they meet every six weeks. Do you find that that's enough, or can it be adjusted if kids students might need more often? Um, we find that it's enough to make sure that the interventions are working. So we want to give them enough time to implement and try the, um, the modifications or changes that we're trying to be doing so that this way students can be introduced to it, have some time to try it, and then we can base that on whether or not they're making progress in those areas. So Sounds. it does come into a perfect amount of time. Thank you. And then my second question, sorry, Mrs. Webb, was about um, the professional development. Um, are you collecting feedback from the teachers about what they find to be most helpful and what they, how they think they would most like to spend their time? Yes, so um, Craig can correct me if I'm wrong. So there are a few things that we're doing a little differently this year is having um, teachers provide feedback to administrators um, based on the professional development that they have and also during our staff meeting time to make sure that we're using their time wisely in the most effective manner that we can. Um, and then also we have a professional development committee that is comprised of teachers of all grade levels that are helping to really guide and steer what the professional development will look like. So it's coming from the teachers based on what their needs are. And then through the uh, PLCs that we have, we'll be able to support them more through um, curriculum work as well. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Caruso. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Feeney. Appreciate it. Um, so I have two questions. I'm looking at the slide about how this helps student success. And I'm just wondering if you could give uh, just a, maybe a couple examples of a better feel of um, students are identified and provided the support. So what kinds of supports that is? Because I think in my head, every time I think of that, I'm thinking more like special ed, um, more traditional special ed supports. And I mean, tied to that, um, how what, what kind of information is going to go back to a parent 
um, what kind of feedback? Sure. So um, when looking at the supports that students have provided, some of it may be um, through the reading specialists that we have. So it might be smaller group instruction during their reading block time. Um, and to have students really focusing on specific skills that they may be having um, some challenges with to be able to provide those interventions. And through the use now of the math tutor that we have, um, we have one currently in place in mostly in fourth and fifth grade um, last year and again this year. And what it is is to work with the teacher to really run some small groups but to focus more specifically on some skills that the students may be having some trouble um, with grasping the concept of. So it's really uh, more of those supports are in class that we look at. Um, in the lower grades too, it would look as um, having access a little bit more time during the day for um, practice with Lexia to be able to really use that phonics program to reinforce the skills that they're being taught. Mm -hmm. So um, those would be more of the general ed type of supports that we put into place. And when we're looking at the information that we're hoping to be sending home to, to parents is to really be able to identify some of the skills based on the math assessments that we do to give, the, to give a better understanding of where there may be some, some um, vulnerabilities with their learning. And through reading, we provide updates um, if students are not meeting the benchmarks through the Dibbles assessment, we're able to provide that information to them as well. And that has been ongoing. Is the, isn't the Dibbles just annually, though, or is it more frequent? Nope. We, um, when students are identified as, um, we, we do them three times a year mm -hmm. for the students, and then progress monitoring as well to make sure. So if there's an area of concern, we can have our reading specialist or our reading tutor help to um, progress monitor to see if there is anything. And we do that also if we have concerns in regards to reading levels or reading comprehension, we can readminister a different level of the Fontes and Pinnell assessments as well. So that this way we can get a better idea and that will look at their comprehension as well as their reading fluency. One more follow on if I can. So, of course. Okay. So is this, is any aspect of this also looking at um, where students sort of on the other end of the spectrum who need more challenge are looking at, you know, where sort of where they are, their growth, that their growth isn't plateauing. Um, so I guess I'm saying does it really get, I saw, you know, you've got tier three, tier two, tier, tier one, and I'm thinking in tier one you have, you know, a really a, a quite a variety, variability of, of student needs there. Absolutely, and that's a focus um, that we're really looking at. We, I always say that we do a, a great job of that at the reading component where students are able to be able to have that ability to find books more at their level and to be able to read and to challenge themselves reading-wise. And now we're hoping with the use of the Math and Focus program where they do have more of those challenging components for students that we will be able to continue to meet their needs for that and identify them through this process as well. Okay, thank you. I had a question on the thank you uh, question on the uh, behavioral part of your presentation yeah. and the uh, pause and think sheet. Uh, can you just talk about uh, how that process works? Uh, how you do that with a student? So it's usually done one-on-one -on -one with the teacher to be able to, and there's usually a conversation ahead of time with the student to be able to, you know, recognize if there was something that wasn't the best choice at that particular moment and to give them the opportunity to do, do you know what happened, you know, what's something we could have done differently, how can you, if this situation came up again, what steps do you think we could take? And then that's an opportunity for the student to fill out that sheet to be able to think about what it is that they may have done. So, is more of a little conference time. Is there any follow-up from that? Or? Um, it does go home to the parents so that they are aware of that. And then when they come back, we just, that would be an opportunity for them to get spotted if that opportunity arrived and then they made the right choice and we could say, hey, you know, this is a great thing that we did. So we really try to find those opportunities where they may have had a bad moment and then was able to correct it and to identify the positive parts of that. Thank you. Dr. Dorks. Um, just after that explanation, I just want to say I love that idea that the person, the student will have a chance to one-on-one -on -one discuss what they did and think about better ways to do it next time and then be recognized potentially next time when they make a better choice. It's sort of 
lets kids make mistakes and then learn from them. So it really and reinforces the learning environment. So I, I really, I think that's great. Um, the other question that I had was just lost in my brain somewhere. <laughs> Oh, the, um, the other thing I wanted to comment on is that I'm really pleased to hear the way you describe the interventions for the, the supports, the multi-tiered supports, because when I was reading about it, one of the concerns that I had was that in education, often the pendulum swings very high from one side to the other, and a long time ago, children were just yanked out of class for their supports. And what I'm hearing about this multi-tiered approach is that the supports are going to be provided in class. Like you said, there might be um, different reading groups, or which, again, I don't want us to go all the way back where you know there was the bluebird and there were, mm -hmm. but but at the same time that the recognition of this least respect restricted environment where kids can be with their peers learning in their way with the supports that they need in their classroom. Because when I initially read it, I was a little worried that, you know, maybe we'd start yanking kids out again. So I just wanted to, to say thank you. That sounds really great. Thank you. Mrs. Borowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question, I have a couple of questions about how, how parents are gonna be engaged in this process. So um, like that pause and think sheet, I think, I think parents will need a little bit of information about what that sheet is and what it's intended to do. Um, else you have, you know, my kid comes home with that and it's, you got in trouble, I don't wanna get one of these again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that there could be a, a real opportunity to talk with parents and help them understand what the goal of that is and perhaps phone calls would be valuable so that they understand what that sheet means and how, and if I just got that sheet cold, without a call from the teacher, I don't know how to read that or understand that. If the teacher calls and said, this was the situation today with your child, here's what happened, here's the conversation we had, you're gonna get a piece of home. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. So I would just encourage Absolutely. you to think about that, about how to engage parents well. And I guess going along with that, on the behavior matrix, you've got in the bathroom, you've got in the cafeteria, you've got in the halls, maybe down the line in a year or two when you're revising it, consider at home. What do these behaviors look like at your house? What do these behaviors look like in the community when you're at the playground or at the soccer field or in the supermarket? That would be a neat way to expand what you're trying to teach. So that would be one idea. And my final question. Of course. Okay. Question. Um, the matrix that I really appreciate that you're explicitly teaching, to your exact point, not just be respectful. This is what that looks like. Here's what we expect to see. How, what is the mechanism in place to make sure that it's regularly being taught in the classroom and not What's the mechanism in place that that will be explicitly taught on an ongoing basis? So we do use our um, monthly assemblies to reinforce all of those. And then also within our classrooms, using the open circle curriculum, they're able to um, align. And that's one of the jobs that um, the, the MTSS team did over the summer was to go through the open circle curriculum and to identify where these um, these, these behaviors that we're asking for on the matrix may align throughout that curriculum and what lessons we could pull out to really have the teachers highlight those along with the rest of them to identify those as pause for those, so they're in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a moment if I asked if the public had any questions? Oh, we have a nice audience. Here. Any <laughs> questions for Mrs. Feeney? Um, I'm wondering about um, with the behavioral aspects as a parent of a person who was in fifth grade last year, which was a very challenging grade, I think, for the school. Um, what are, um, how are teachers trained to make those um, tier interventions in a way that's productive and helpful for the community? So that's done during the SST time, and that's where we work with our school psychologists to be able to have open conversations about some of the behaviors that we're seeing and some of the strategies that we may be able to put in place to help support them. So that all gets done during that time so that we're able to um, collectively look at different issues that we're having. And yes, last year we spent a lot of time um, on on the grade level for that. So, so are all the teachers involved in those SST meetings? The grade level teachers. All yes. the grade level teachers are? Mm -hmm. and But they do only happen every six weeks. Yes. So and there are times in two. Five times a year? Yes. And okay. so there, if needed, we can reconvene a team or if it's one teacher that has a specific 
area that they're concerned with, they can meet with myself and um, Mrs. Brett, who was Mrs. Catoni last year, um, mm -hmm. to have that opportunity to do that. So it's ongoing as needed, but the formal part of it is every six weeks. So. <coughs> Oh. Of course. It's just course. a very quick question when you mentioned the math and focus differentiation. Um, I went to that initial meeting where you brought that really good trainer in and talked to everyone and they talked about, so math and focus has been in for a couple of years, but I guess I haven't One seen year. it One with year. either of my kids. One year. One year? Yes. Last year. This, is the, the year. this is the second year. So, yeah, it was first grade. So, is this new training going to be involved, teaching them about the differentiation? Because I look in the books and I see the page. Oh, if you need review, do this. An extra challenge. And neither gets assigned to, I, I just see the regular pages assigned. Are the teachers going to be starting to be trained on how to use yes. differentiation and they, now? they are using some of those pages. Um, some of them are implementing that part of it. Again, okay. you know, every expert starts somewhere. Um, and with a program, this being the second year that we're implementing it, is it is one that, you know, now that we've gone through the one year of using those packets and being able to look at the resources a little differently and to, you know, the group that went to Topsfield and Boxford to be able to have conversations with other teachers who have used it. It has um, now started to open up those conversations of looking at ways that we can make sure that we're using those and having the trainers come in will be able to do that as well. Thanks. In the back? Yes, I, I just want to make a comment on the, the, the team meetings, which Ms. Feeney and I have spoken about was, and it did bring up the issue of the half the half day on Wednesday. Right now, the meetings are taking place during the school day, so the team, the entire grade level, has a substitute. And my point to Ms. Feeney, and we had a long conversation about it, is we've always been told that we have early release on Wednesdays so that the teachers can collaborate and have team meetings. Therefore, in my opinion, they should we should never have a day where our kids have a substitute for an entire grade level for these meetings when they have the block of time in the Wednesday afternoons. For instance, this past Wednesday, we had Tuesday as a professional development day. We came back in the fourth grade, had substitutes on that Wednesday. And it seems like you have the block of time. It should be done during that half day of Wednesdays. Thank you. I don't have a comment to that. <laughs> Thank you. The lady in the way back. In the way back, sorry. Okay. Um, on the notification to parents for the students if they've been identified and brought into the um, student support team, is that new? Because that you'll be notifying the parents. So those are um, general life conversations. So if there are supports being in place, so reading any reading support, there has been notification sent home that they have been seeing the reading specialist. Um, so those have, and the math support is new to us this year for all of the grades, so that will be communicated home. And then will they get updates? Yes, about that's the, the plan to be doing that, yes. Okay, and those will occur? So <coughs> it, it happens, um, the progress monitoring is, I believe, every two weeks with that, and so we would be able to communicate with the progress monitoring for Dibbles in regards to how students are doing. Okay, and so that's starting this year? This year, yes. Okay, and then just one suggestion on the Title I program. Um, last year, when the Title I program was used, um, I received notice that my child was eligible for it after the program actually started. Um, and then it's, you know, before school, a lot of us work, a lot of us have, you know, other commitments, and we can't just change our schedules to get our child into the, you know, a half hour earlier to school. So I would suggest that there be advance notice so that people actually eligible and need the services actually have time to plan and get their children in instead of being informed after the program actually starts. So we're actually looking at having some after school components as well, so that might help parents schedule it as well. Well, I saw. Yes. Any question? You said that. Um, you were looking at having math and focus people come and do some additional support with the teachers. Yes. Um, is that been scheduled yet, or is that something just an open-ended um, Mr. Martin and I have been looking at dates um, and, and collaborating with the, the trainer because we do need to work with their schedule as well. So there are a few dates that we're looking at and making sure that they're the best use of time um, that we'll be able to get them into see multiple grade levels. Okay, Mrs. Feeney, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Um, 
Dr. Doherty, I see that you have that slide up, but I'm going to ask, I, I think I see a lot of parents who are probably anxious to get home at some point this evening. <laughs> and since we have no lives here, could we move on? <laughs> could we move you on? You don't want to hear the riveting no, presentation that Ms. Wilson has ready for Oh, you? and I actually spoke <laughs> with Ms. Wilson. I, I went over there. I, uh, I told her I'd buy dinner. I'd do something. But uh, would it be okay if we move to the full day kindergarten discussion? Because I'm getting a sense that that's probably what uh, some, some folks are waiting for. Is that okay? Fine, all right, I'm then. here all night. So. <laughs> I'll ask the chair. The chair says it's okay. <laughs> Um, so this evening we're going to have a, uh, a discussion on full day kindergarten and planning for next year. Uh, Dr. Doherty, the floor is yours. So the packet, uh, I made some changes to the, to the memo that I sent. Um, I was trying to find a way to make the table three especially clearer, so I, I hope I captured that. Um, I did send this to the committee this <coughs> afternoon, but if you need a paper copy, it's, it's coming around. Different from the half a tree copy, yes. but consistent with what was sent out this afternoon. The, the biggest change is table three. Um, okay. Made some. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it makes more sense. Oh. <laughs> So this is a, um, this is a, um, a discussion that the committee discuss, began discussing last year um, when we were discussing space needs. And Kindergarten, yeah. so I want to, um, I want to, Kind of give a little bit of history first, and then and then we can go from from there. So the table one in the memo talks about uh, full day full day kindergarten actually started once the fifth elementary school came online. Wood End, um, actually Barrows was the fifth elementary school because they moved into Wood End for a year, um, and then and then built Barrows. Um, so when the five elementary schools came online, that is when full day kindergarten was uh, was fully started, which is the 2005 six school year. At the time, for a variety of reasons, it was only 32% of the students enrolled in full-day kindergarten. Full-day kindergarten wasn't really looked upon as something that um, was an important part of a child's educational life in 2005-06. Over the last several years, not just in Reading, but um, across the country, full-day kindergarten has become a very important part of um, the educational needs of, of students and and a lot of districts Massachusetts included it is now um, a mandatory part of kindergarten um, so what we've tried to do over the last several years is as um, as the demand has grown we have we have tried to um, find a way to meet that demand so you can see that over the last several years that the percentage of students that have been involved in full day kindergarten is, has grown. Um, this year it is at 71 percent, um, which is uh, 228 students right now out of 322 are in, are in full day kindergarten. Um, when, when the five elementary schools were originally, uh, well, when the fifth elementary school was originally designed and there was a lot of discussion about what the five school plan would look like. Um, the original plan was to only have one full day kindergarten classroom in each building mm -hmm. because at the time it wasn't considered as something that would grow. Um, so the, the design of the building was set up that way. And as you can see over time that, that that's changed. What, what else has happened over time though is that because full day kindergarten has grown, um, and it's become a need for many families is that other spaces have been compromised. Um, you can see that table two, table two gives you a breakdown of the total general classrooms that we have at each of our schools, the classrooms that are currently being used for those um, schools. In some, in some cases there's more because other spaces are being used. Um, 
We also have a listing of what current art classrooms, music classrooms, um, special education classrooms, and in other spaces. A, a couple of things about art and music. Um, when the fifth elementary school was put online, there was a commitment made to try to maintain one undedicated art room and one dedicated music room um, for those programs. I think that um, you could see by the quality of art program and music programs that we have in this district, um, we've done everything we can to, to try to maintain that. Unfortunately, what has happened over time um, is that we've now collapsed it to one room for the two. So most, and, and usually this is what happens, it, what has been happening is our music classroom has, and Josh Wheaton is a perfect example of that, um, the music classroom is on the stage now, uh, which is difficult because lunch is happening and you have scheduling conflicts that occur um, with lunch, so classes can't be held during that time. So it, it does really create um, you know, a difficult atmosphere. In terms of special education, and, and Mrs. Wilson, I'm sure, can talk about this in more detail, um, currently all five schools have programs. After next year, that'll go down to four as we are transitioning the DLC program um, from Barrows to Birch Meadow. And the major reason why we did that is because the students, when they left Barrows, were going to Coolidge, which was not a feeder school for all of the peers in that school. So it made sense to make that move. Um, in an ideal situation, and I'm, I'm also citing regulation here, you would want, um, assuming you have a program in the building, you would want to have a K-2 learning center, a 3-5 to five learning center, a K-2 to program space, and a 3-5 to five program space. There are actually regulations that say you can't have students in the same classroom in a 48-month age span. Um, there have been times over the years that we've been in violation of that, and I that's not a that's not a mystery we have been um, and we've done everything we can to try to mitigate that um, by putting up um, uh, petitions things like that um, to address it and we've had to file waive for waivers uh, to make that happen um, so this isn't really just a full day kindergarten issue that we're dealing with it's a it's a total space issue that that we have a space crunch at our elementary schools um, if you move to table three, um, table three captures the existing rooms that are um, for full-day kindergarten right now, the existing half-day kindergarten classrooms. What makes this a little bit tricky is that we've got two of our schools that are integrated, so the half-days are mixed in with the full-day students. Um, so I decided not to count those as half-day spaces but full-day spaces. Um, you also see a listing of the existing special education classrooms. And what is challenging about this number is that we may have special education programs in spaces other than classroom spaces, um, which may not always be um, large enough, uh, large enough classroom size, but still, you know, that's where the program is. So that the number is deceiving sometimes when you see existing special education spaces. Um, I purposely put a zero for overflow classroom spaces because one of the things in this chart that is not captured is what happens when you have some population bubbles come through. And that's happened over the years when you've had a large class come through. And if you've only allocated three classrooms for that grade or four, and I do remember one year at Josh Reed we had five class classes for a grade a few years back. Um, I think it's actually currently our sophomore class. Um, so, you know, what you see in this chart does not capture any additional space, and you really should build in a, a small flexibility of an extra classroom uh, in, a, in a school in case you do have that, that bubble. Um, so that is not captured in this, um, this chart. Um, the rest of the chart talks about the total classrooms that we would need if we were going to fully implement full day K. Um, if we were going to make sure that we had adequate special education space for our learning centers and our programs and our art and music classrooms. So the, the bottom, the line at the bottom <coughs> of table three is probably the one that makes the most sense, is when you do all of these calculations, um, these are the total additional classrooms needed for space needs in full day K if we were fully implementing and making sure that all programs had adequate space. 
Um, you can see that three of the schools would require two additional classrooms, Barrows, Birch Meadow, and Wood End, and then two would require four additional classrooms, Eaton and Killam. Um, the other piece of this equation that we can't factor in is preschool, mm -hmm. because Wood End right now currently is housing two RISE preschool classes, um, because we don't have enough space here for, for RISE. Um, so that's another piece of the equation that um, we're, we, we have looked at, and I know that the early childhood space group will be looking at as well. Um, so when you look at all of this data, Nick? I ask a question before you go to sure. on the charts. Uh, on uh, table two, you have the uh, learning center uh, at Barrows. Yes. I think I he heard you say that we don't need a learning center unless there's a program at the school. No, we have learning centers in all of our schools. But if, with the DLC moving out of there, do we still need to use that as a learning center? Yes. Okay, I misunderstood. Yes. Thank you. See what you started? Mrs. Webb? So, <laughs> one of the lines that Mr. Robinson was going, so can you just um, clarify for me then um, with respect to the learning center and special education space, um, specifically sort of the K to two, three to five breakdowns, so that in the table three, Barrows would have um, one learning, currently has one learning center, would need an additional learning center, and does that enable you to then do the breakout that you need for the K to two learning center and three to five? But they don't, they will not have, after this year, they will not have a program in their building. They won't have a, the DLC Correct. program, but they'll still have a learning center. Yes. Yeah, the learning center is different. Learning centers are different from, from programs. I'm trying to understand how, how these classrooms, numbers of classrooms, achieve the breakout of space, because I count four separate spaces for that additional special education classrooms needed. So, right, if you're supposed to have a K to two and then a separate three to five learning space, or mm -hmm. I don't know what the definition is. So that's four spaces then if you had all these programs. You're talking about Barrows? And all well, you, need is, all you would need is two at Barrows. You need two at Barrows, and that, that, would, that would address the separate K to two and three to five learning right. center space. And then at um, Eaton, you actually need what you have existing. Oh, you need the four, and that again addresses the right. K to two, three to five right. separate learning center and um, LLD. Correct. Okay, so this brings this classroom count brings that in compliance for the correct uh, coordinated yeah. program. Okay, that's what I'm trying to understand. And I understand Rise is not on here, um, but I think obviously as we go down the road, we need to understand that because that's you know right. the classrooms. Because if you just were to if you if you're just sort of adding up classrooms here, you know Rise what currently has four plus they're sort of minus two because they've got them taking wood end and the end we're only and we had I don't know a waiting what would our waiting list ended up being but 25 we had students. 25 on a waiting list okay 25 students so that's you know another classroom at least probably two really at the preschool age right so you're talking um, eight seven or eight eight more classrooms anyways when that can I ask you? Okay. Well, the reason I'm, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to murky the waters with rise because the focus tonight was on, on, on kindergarten. kindergarten. Okay, um, I get it. Wednesday's meeting, which yeah. is the early childhood group, that that data will be part of the discussion. Okay, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, I just so just a follow up question on the learning center. So that this is a new component of uh, we have we've been talking about space for a while, and now I'm finding out <coughs> that. That Barrows needs is going to need another learning center. No, we've uh, we've, 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 been been about about, we've been talking about learning centers. We've been talking about we've been talking about all day K classrooms and Rise classrooms. We haven't been talking about additional learning, learning centers. No, we the the conversations that I, in the presentations I made last year, special education was always part of the conversations. I, yeah, at, at the coordinated program view, I don't think. 
we never had a date a chart that sort of broke it out like this there had been discussions about our lack of compliance because of the need to separate it I mean I've certainly heard that you know right. we've got the dividers and we're sort of getting by but we're in violation and that definitely was talked about I just don't think we've ever seen like the you know the data what, broken out what's like different that. with this chart maybe this is what you're referring to is that I never broke down the special ed rooms for you I said we needed special education classrooms. I didn't break it down for you what the needs were. I'm trying to be more specific. So if I went back to, the, to when we had uh, schematics for how many uh, rooms we needed in a building, it would tie to this chart? No, because the needs were different then. The, the designs of those buildings, don't forget, that was 2000, well, it was probably before 2005. because I'm, I'm referring to last, fall, last spring. When we, when we had our working group meetings and we came up with... No, we did talk about that, sure. So that would, then the same we, number... Okay. We did talk about that, yep. Mr. Director, I continue. Okay. So um, in your conversation, it really comes down to <coughs> what I see essentially three options that the, the committee could look at and, and maybe there are... Um, sub options to the options um, one option is to limit the number of full-day kindergarten classrooms to one per school um, which is what we, we where we were in 2005 six um, to do this would certainly uh, result in a lottery system based on the data the historical data that we've had over the last several years um, I actually should back up for a second the um, we the census indicates and the census is not entirely accurate but the census indicates that we have 322 five-year-olds living in Reading um, we have seen over time that the census isn't a good predictor of the incoming kindergarten class um, usually it's um, it's less but we don't you know we don't know so our Scientific estimate would be it's going to be about 300 students in kindergarten, but that could, that could it could be it could be a completely different number. Um, so knowing that, uh, the first option could be limiting it to one per school. You would go to a lottery. That's 22 students in each. Assuming that you would go with 22 um, in a um, in a classroom, um, that's 110 students. Uh, for the, for the full day kindergarten, which is about a 50% reduction from this year, from this year's numbers. Um, another option is to limit the no, total number of kindergarten classrooms to three classrooms in each building. So by doing that, you would still most likely in some schools have to do a lottery, um, but you would, you, it would be based on the number of students that are coming into that school for kindergarten. Um, so, for example, if you have a situation where 44 of the 73 students want full-day kindergarten, um, you would have two full-day kindergartens and then of 22 each and then two half-day sessions of 15 and 14. Um, you know, so that's certainly, that's certainly a, another option that you could pursue. Um, the integrated classroom would, could be certainly used as part of this option. The, Superintendent's option, which, which I've been using now for the last four or five years, would still be in effect because we still want to try to balance the class sizes <coughs> as much as possible across uh, the district. And then the third option would be to eliminate full-day kindergarten altogether. Um, and there are certainly some downsides or difficulties with this. One is an educational um, issue. Um, you know, the research is very clear, the benefits of full-day kindergarten, and you would be going from where 71% of the students are in full-day kindergarten to zero. Um, there are some special education students that are coming from RISE that will require a full-day program. If we are not able to provide it, we would have to have that student go out <coughs> of district. So that would be an added expense um, to the district. Um, so there are certainly some downsides to, to that option. Um, 
So those are those are essentially the the three different options. There may be others out there that I hadn't thought of, but um, I don't know if at this point you want to take questions or. I do, if you're if, if you're done, uh, but I get to go first because I'm the chair. <laughs> um, so uh, I. I'd, I hate this. I don't actually have a question yet. I'm going to have yep. questions, but I do want to make a comment. Um, I, I know that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Webb was on the committee when we first started experimenting with full-day K, and I came in the year, maybe either that same year or a year after that. Um, and it was, a, um, it was very successful. Uh, it was based on a lottery. I can remember my first few years of being on the school committee getting a lot of phone calls from parents very upset that their child wasn't able to get into Birch Meadow, which was my, my neighborhood where my kids were growing up, uh, but all the districts in school. Um, I, I guess I want to offer almost a public apology. I, I didn't pay enough attention when we stopped doing the lottery and we started trying to accommodate as many kids wanted to come in, mm -hmm. which has created both, both a, pro a, a good and a bad problem. I mean, it's wonderful that we're able to offer this amazing full day program that <coughs> seems to be being met with success, um, but it's also what's causing this space issue. Um, I don't remember, I, I, I don't think it was that necessarily we stopped doing the lottery, we just kept finding classrooms through the years and it, this is how this problem sort of got to this point. Um, my only, I guess my point there is that it's a great problem, but it's a problem we need to solve. Um, I, for one, and I can offer my opinion, I don't know why we would put that option number three even on the list. It's probably some sort of, hey, here's all the options, but it's certainly not an option I'm ever going to entertain. Um, and I, I, we could probably go around the committee really quickly and assure you that that's not going to be an option that we're going to explore. Um, personally, I think the option lies somewhere in number two, and I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm hoping that we can figure out an option in the number two area that gives full day kindergarten to as many students as we can successfully um, manage. And by successfully manage, I mean not only at the kindergarten, but I mean at all K through five. I don't want to get an extra classroom of full day K um, if, if it's going to hurt our third or fourth or fifth grade programs. I think I'm stating the obvious, but it's probably worth stating. Okay, that's my rant for that point. I don't have questions yet, but I'm sure they're can going to. Can I just? But I didn't ask a question. No, but I need to, I, I want to make Go one ahead, comment. Go ahead, Dr. Thank um, you. I want to, I, the one thing I didn't, I, I wanted to mention, I, I know Ms., Mrs. Downey was yeah. that, uh, uh, at, brought up this point earlier, and I direct you to the enrollment chart. Got it. Because um, I think, I think it's important to clarify some concerns that may be out there back. that, um, so, we started using the superintendent's option um, with the current fourth grade several years ago. Sorry, Dr. Ray. We started using the superintendent's option. School committee gave me the oh. authority to, to balance across the district, both at the kindergarten level and when students moved in, the, w with our current fourth grade. I thought that it actually had it happened earlier. even earlier. No, in, in current fourth grade, which is why you cool. see the Joshua Eaton number in fifth grade at 25 and 26, because pretty much that's been the class size for several years in that school at, for that grade. Okay. Um, Can I? So I sorry, just a point of clarification. What you said is that that 25, 25, and 26 at Eaton was before you were given the <coughs> flexibility Correct. of assigning kids to other. Correct. Okay. Correct. Understood. Thank you, Dr. Dart. So, you know, I think if you look at the class sizes in grades one through four, well, I mean, we can start with, with one and two. You know, the school committee has um, 18 to 22 for K to two and mid-20s for three to five. Those, those are the guidelines that we've been following. So with the exception of grade five at Joshua Eaton, um, you know, we have worked in, real hard in the other grades to, to keep those class sizes in, that, in those ranges. The one place that we have not been able to do that was this year with the, with the kindergarten at Joshua Eaton. And you'll notice, and, and I've kept the committee updated 
as this was evolving last year, um, was the 24s and 25s. And to address that, we put in for the, the morning piece, because this is these are integrated kindergartens, the additional para support, so that there are now, in the mornings, there are three adults in that room at all, in those classrooms at all times, in, in the morning room? sessions. I'm sorry? Three adults in each room? In each room. Okay. Right. The teacher, full-time para, and then the part-time para, which is there for the mornings. Right. Um, so that, those were, those were put in place to start the year. Um, so we have done everything we can to keep those class sizes balanced. Um, and I think the class sizes, other than those two classroom, uh, those two grades, I think we've, we've done what we can to accomplish that. Um, now, what makes it tricky sometimes with the, this option, and it happened this year with the kindergarten at Eaton, is that sometimes people move in within a stone's throw of the school. And, and I said this the other night um, at Ms. Feeney's presentation, is that I have difficulty moving a child to Barrows or Killam when they can walk across the street and go to their, their neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, that's the challenge you face when, when you don't have the space and that flexibility. If we had an additional classroom at Eaton, we would have, I would have recommended to the committee we put a teacher there to get those class sizes down. Um, so I wanted to add that piece. No, to, that's fine. To your I, I appreciate that. Mrs. Webb. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, so um, <coughs> I think when you look at um, option three, I just want to clarify this. Uh, uh, the only option, if we were forced to comply with the coordinated program review, and have the separate classrooms. Mm -hmm. If I look at the space right now, the only way to do that is probably to potentially have to go to this item three. I'm trying to understand under, I agree with Mr. Caruso that this would not be a direction that we would want to go in. It would be stepping back from, you know, where we've, we've been and clearly what the community wants. But I'm also trying to understand you know, how do we meet the, the needs of the special education requirements? Um, and just trying to understand whether that's going to be, you know, whether this option three is something that we are going to have to look at harder because of um, the special education needs. Well, so I'm just trying to. Sort I think of there's two that. ways you can look at this. I mean, mm -hmm. one side you could look at is that if you don't have full day K, you may have an increase in special education right. students right. because that, that's, that's an intervention, mm -hmm. a regular education intervention that could be beneficial to students that could become special education if they don't get those interventions early enough. So, right. um, you know, the, the special education piece is tricky, and again, uh, Carolyn can probably articulate this right. better, is because it's <coughs> not something that you can predict Right. In you know, it depends students. on the needs of the students, mm -hmm. their, their disabilities, and, you know, do we have the program space for them? Um, most of the time we're able to address it, <coughs> which we've been trying to do. There are occasions, though, where we haven't been able to address it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, and in terms of the, um, you know, limiting to three per school, that's basically where we are right now in terms of, we have three classrooms at each school between the full day and half day classrooms, right? So limiting the total number of kindergarten classrooms to three per school is basically what we have in table three right now. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So it's, I mean, it still leaves us in terms of even that scenario leaves us with a gap of um, 14 classrooms um, and it's still only serves you know 71 percent of the population and doesn't address the whole rise thing but um i think the lottery was the lottery was difficult in that scenario clearly we would have the lottery and the superintendent's option but um i know that it was as difficult as it was it was you know certainly it's better than option three um or in this case option one and it was it was extremely well done and I, I you know some of the um, 
process points that Dr. Darty has here, I think, are important process points in terms of notification. I know a parent had an earlier issue with, you know, getting upfront notice. So um, I know it was extremely well run lottery and um, had a high degree of integrity is just never a comfortable situation when, you know, you're the parent that is no and, you know, what's the option? Well, you know, you can drive to Wood End instead of kill them or whatever. But um, those <coughs> options are going to continue to be li limited. But in the early stages of this program, there were, there were more still openings available than there were uh, than, than students who wanted to or parents who, who wanted their students to attend the full day. So it's, an, it's, it's, I think, a real success story. It's really unfortunate that, you know, we as a community and a committee and just haven't really been able to keep up and in front of, um, you know, how do we make sure that we have the capacity to fill the need. And it's and clearly we're here right now because we don't have a solution to that. We were hoping to be on our way to have a solution to that, and um, you know we're we're sort of stalled. So we're we're going to be in this interim place for a couple of years, actually. So, thank you, Mrs. Brasky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I tend to agree with my fellow committee members about the third option, which is to eliminate this program because of our lack of space. Um, and I guess I just want to take a moment to articulate that. And I, Dr. Doherty alluded to this, but it isn't just about what we want to do in Reading, but I think it's about looking at the whole picture and knowing that the majority of cities and towns in Massachusetts already offer this and that the state is offering Chapter 70 reimbursements to towns and cities to incent them to offer this. And there are several states, and I can't remember how many, there are several states in the United States where it's mandatory. So we are, Reading doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? We, a, our educational district exists in a culture that's moving in this direction. And to, to, to step back from that, I think, puts us in um, what I perceive to be a dangerous position competitively. So I think that's how I am, that's how I'm thinking about this, is it's not just about what we want to do in Reading, it's about what's happening everywhere else and how do we compare. So I would also, it feels to me like number two is where we need to be. Um, and the one s hopeful bit is it sounds like we're hoping the incoming kindergarten class might be a bit smaller a bit than small. this year's, yep. and maybe that will allow us once again to make it happen. <coughs> I'm going to make a comment to that too, Mrs. Browski. Um, I, I hope everyone realizes it's not that we don't want <coughs> to offer full day kindergarten. We absolutely do, and that's all we've been talking about for seems like two or three years now we simply don't have the space and that's what this conversation is about and I, I'm kind of looking at our audience this evening I, I want everyone to realize that we want full day kindergarten for every single student we also want preschool we just don't have the space and that's what we're talking about tonight we're trying to figure out how we can accommodate as many kids as we can without putting the district at risk for the next I don't know, couple years year two years by the time that kid's ready for kindergarten, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, a couple. <laughs> I know. Uh, question, I, 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 if it's okay, I'm going to see if I can get the committee's questions first, but I absolutely promise I'm going to answer everyone's questions. Or I'm not going to answer them. I'm going to allow you to ask them. Go ahead, Dr. Well, I, I'm sort of in a quandary because um, I hate lotteries because I really think that community is important. And when you have someone that receives what they're really wanting and next door they have not received it it impacts who plays with whom and who's happy in the community and it just drives a wedge in a wonderful community and i say that because we our family has lo have loved reading and so i hate the idea of a lottery so where my brain keeps going uh, okay so put that right here so the other piece of it is what um, related to what Mrs. Borowski was saying in terms of the big picture. The big picture is that um, the state and educational theory is recommending full day kindergarten. Not all parents want full day kindergarten. So, and I understand that. Um, so I actually would differ a little in saying that it's really nice to be able to offer a choice and maybe that could help us, but then we have the challenge of equalizing classrooms numbers, and it's just an added complication. Um, 
The other piece of that big pic picture is I was reading um, some of the school committee members are going to a conference in November and part of that conference is a meeting of the Mass Association of School Committees and they do, I'm new to this, but they talk about resolutions in terms of communicating with the legislature and one of the things that they're recommending is um, school systems being mandated to offer even preschool programs. I don't think we're there yet, but what they're trying to do is follow that trajectory to equalize the opportunities for all children. Mm. Um, and if, and I, it, I don't know the timing on that, I'm not saying it's next year or whatever, but if the, we're thinking about offering these opportunities to all children, I don't see how we cannot think about long term now. So that's where I'm at. Like, we can't think about just this year or just next year. We need to think about in three years, and we need to plan and lay the groundwork for that. And to me, thinking about doing a lottery long term is just going to eat away at our community. And we, I think we can see what happens when community starts to break down and people are worried about getting along and whether our kids are getting the best thing. And it just sets people against each other. So um, I would love for people to have a choice. If it works, I think that's difficult to work out. I hate the lottery, but I wouldn't want us to eliminate full day kindergarten. So that goes to my next <coughs> thinking outside the box. And I, I think it's very difficult. And I remember a conversation to this effect um, maybe last spring where if it were an interim situation, if there were a plan put in place for long term, might there be a way with local kindergarten uh, preschools that might have room for a third year where they go into kindergarten whether there could be uh, it's just you know just trying to brainstorm if there would be a place for kids who don't get into the full day choice that they want might there be a place in town that they could go I, I'm speaking I'm off sure the cup I'm um, I think I, I, are there I, I, and I'm not I'm, it's been too long for me are there other schools in Reading that offer kindergarten um, programs I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this I believe there are yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm so, so, so you're saying private be. will a private full day K take the overflow the kids that didn't think right well, if there were some kind of relationship that we could build that would help that's a good idea that's someone good. that doesn't make the lottery go to a full day kindergarten for just that interim. I, I don't expect an answer. It's just trying to think about options. I, I Does it make sense? It, it, it absolutely makes sense. It, it, sorry, if I, if I could quickly, and then Mrs. Broski had her hand up next, but it, it's working with our other, the other preschools and schools in town, seeing, hey, can we work together through this problem? I'm not aware of any private kindergarten in Reading that wouldn't take I thought those a, kinds a parents of partnerships parents money. Though were illegal. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the question. So I don't, I don't know. The, 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 I thought the partnerships yeah, between I, the public... I'm not, I'm not guys, yeah, I'm not prepared to... Uh, listen, I'm not looking for a partnership. I'm sorry that I just said listen. I'm not looking for a partnership. Yeah. I'm simply saying, if you don't get into full-day kindergarten in Reading, I know there's other schools that will take your money. Yeah. So contact them and figure it out if it didn't work out. Lovely. Yeah. Careful. The, because then we'll start talking about raising It's a the lot more money, the other kindergartens? Sure. Oh, okay. Can Mrs. Borowski had her hand up first. And then, wait, wait, is it in line with this conversation? Yes. Okay, sorry, Mrs. So Borowski, please. And it's quick. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, I'm very sensitive to everything that Dr. Doxer just said um, in terms of the impact of lotteries on communities. And, and really, I, I like the creativity and thinking outside the box. But I think this evening, correct me if I'm wrong, what Dr. Doherty is looking for is what next year we have kindergartners coming in in September and he needs direction from this committee with what to do for next year now on Wednesday the early childhood space group will be meeting to discuss exactly that's the long-term solution which mm -hmm. clearly needs to be addressed so I, I think um, I'm very sensitive to everything you're saying but I think that might be a good, those are great ideas to bring to Wednesday night's meeting and to that group you should be the chair <laughs> this is um, I just want to say that regarding the lottery I probably don't um, hate the lotteries as much as Linda. I don't like them, but I want to say that I was on the committee for five years 
when we did those lotteries. And again, it's not comfortable, but kids are often more resilient than we are. Sometimes we as parents put a lot of our own fears and, and, and our own uh, junk sometimes on our kids when they don't even know yet what they should be afraid of. They're so, just so excited about it. So some of it is, you know, the, the way that we position it. And I don't really think over those five years that it was, it was incredibly divisive. Now, over those five years, the, the programs, we were able to grow the programs. And so to, we got to this point, right, where people, you know, weren't, the lottery was, was not necessary anymore. And that was a great thing. But I don't think that in that five-year period where we ran the lottery, that it was a high degree of divisiveness. And there was, in many cases, the students went to the other schools. Um, you know, it's not a good, it's not a choice for every parent because if you already have another child going to that school, you know, can you make the two trips in the morning? And, you know, there's a lot of logistics and things. But if your choice is a private kindergarten too, that isn't going to be much different logistically. So I just want to say I think, you know, we all have to, um, you know, make, make lemonade in, with lemons instead of, um, puckering in our cheeks all and turning away and and um i think we've got to you know this is this is a case where we've got a choice next year we either have to be figure out and have the lemonade or you know we're, we're going to be just driving ourselves crazy all year and to follow on with that we have to be really committed to the process that's going forward about looking at the space needs and really i think as a committee we, we have to make sure that we do everything we can to have this community dialogue so that when we get to town meeting next year or the year after or when, wherever it is, we have the whole community behind us. So any of you kindergarten parents that not, aren't yet on town meeting, we need people. We always need people to make that farm. So um, I think, you know, I, I think it's a difficult decision, but um, it's certainly the one that will allow us to serve the most students next year. Thank you. I'm going to open up to the public. I have one. One more comment. Oh, of course, Mr. Knight. I'm sorry. Sure, thank you. So, you know, I, I almost am frustrated that we have to discuss this because I really think, and as I know we have the committee that's focusing on it, but there's, to me there's no option other than to have a full-day kindergarten program. In, in this day and age, the expectations that our students have, um, MCAS, PARC, uh, it, it's incredible to think that we don't have it, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, if we have to do something, stopgap measure, then, you know, obviously three is not a solution. I don't like the idea of limiting anybody. Um, I also think, though, that the, pro the process that we have now, there's some inequity in it. There's, there's students that um, potentially, um, I know I've talked to Jean about this, um, you know, her peers are, you know, I'm a little bit older, so <laughs> she's got closer peers that can talk about that. I do, I do have resources, though. I do have a niece that's in the district and, and, the, and uh, neighbors as well. And, and, you know, there's some parents, I think, that probably can't justify, you know, $4,500 because... 42. Uh, 42. 42. Okay, might be more next year, but anyway. <laughs> um, that's another didn't discussion. Say that. another, <laughs> that's another discussion. <laughs> but, but, um, but I know there's others that just flat out can't afford it. And, and it's concerning to me that, um, you know, you can say what you want about, well, I remember when I was, you know, part of the school district when this came about, and I remember questioning the whole concept of, well, they're going to go to school a full day, but in the afternoon they're not going to do anything any more than they would get in the morning, which is, well, that's crazy. That's going to be, it, I mean, if that's the case, then we might as well just, you know, put them outside and have recess. Um, it, it's, the purpose of it is to, to extend the learning, and um, I agree with Dr. Darty that, you know, we, we, this could have an impact on a special needs population, but, uh, you know, it has to happen in one way, shape, or form. And, you know, I look at some of the options, and I'm not a part of the, the early childhood um, uh, working group. Uh, thank you. Um, so, you know, I do think, that, you know, my input would be that, you know, look at all types of options, you know, e even this space right here, to be perfectly honest, if we, um, you know, it's, it ha has happened in the past where the, the superintendent's office was out of the uh, school buildings and, and in a private location, um, whether it's good or bad to have that happen. But if that's going to help move, adjust, you know, maybe provide more preschool but also open up space in some of the other buildings, 
then it has to be looked at too. I'm, I'm assuming it will be, but um, without any doubt, uh, um, we have to have full day kindergarten in this day and age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that okay. whole thing. That lets us know the crowd. So, I uh, can't wait to hear your input. I, I do want to kind of reiterate what Mrs. Browski said, which is we are all in alignment with, with, with what Mr. Nine very eloquently put. We want full day kindergarten for everybody. We do not have enough space for September. This committee needs to give the superintendent guidance on what we should do for next September. Right. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that one of the comments tonight is going to be helping us get there and not just reiterating that we really need full day kindergarten. Is one that cool? One last comment that I just but, want to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I was a top have been a town meeting member for over 20 years. And I do recall that in, um, and I was also a part of Barrows Elementary School going to Wood End, so I'm familiar with that, that whole circumstance for that year. But, but I, I do distinctly recall that it wasn't so much Dr. Doherty said, uh, you know, uh, that we would try to maintain the art and music classrooms, but I'm not necessarily sure that's the case. I thought we made a commitment mm. to do that. Yeah, we did. Absolutely. We yeah. did. Yep. So, uh, and I'm disappointed to say that, you know, to see that, um, you know, music classes on the, in, on the stage. Um, having been a specialist that's taught on stages before, it's not a conducive setting, and, and it minimizes the value of art, music, and physical education when you put them in locations like that. Um, so anything we can do to prevent that, I think, is important as well. I, I don't know. Yeah, and I don't know in which order. Uh, please, I just saw you put your hand up. Um, speak loud, or else I'm going to make that. you come up here and say your name. I will speak loudly. Do you need me? Is it recorded? Yeah, I can project um, toward it. It's, there's it's microphones. better if I'm fine going to speak. We've got yeah. microphones, we've got cameras, we've got oh, all kinds of modern day technology. But please. That way, people who are watching. If the you're program, comfortable coming up, please come up. If you're not comfortable, talk loud. Okay, Agreed. and mine, mine is a recommendation. Great, thank you. Um, along the lines of working with maybe option two, where people still have an option, it may lead to a lottery, and thinking about off-site space, if there are more children who are, are who, who want to, more families who want full-day kindergarten than not, um, being sure to give off-site providers really early notice. Little Treasures has done this in the past. They've, their program is very small now because as, off, as all day kindergarten in the schools has grown, their program has shrunk. Um, Montessori just recently told me this year, because I looked into it for my son for what I call his kindergarten gap year, um, you know, basically hold, holding him for another year. Um, they told me that no, 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 they don't accept for just kindergarten. You need to be there for multiple years. So it might not be a full on public private partnership, but having a good stream of communication and looking for perhaps just enough space to tide the school district over, maybe if it's an off site space, but having that good communication with the very few providers that there are. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. You. Can I ask a question, Dr. Doherty? Uh, it, thank you. Uh, it's not just space. I, I know it's primarily space, but we also are then going to have to find the funding for the additional teachers that would be teaching in those spaces. Is that a fair assessment, or do you, th if we had the classrooms, do you have the teachers? Well, you talking about if we went full day kindergarten for everybody? If we were able to put four classrooms in each elementary school for next year for full day kindergarten, I'm assuming. I thought I was making an obvious statement, but I'm assuming you'd need to then hire additional teachers. Yes. Okay. If but, you but, get tuition. but you're also getting yeah no and I get it and we'd be getting tuition and if we ever did right, go to full it, day yeah no, it'd I just be tuition to make sure. and then but if you went completely full day kindergarten for everyone for everyone you uh, there'd be eventually a bridge here you yep. would have to fund exactly um, sorry next yes I was curious if redistricting the elementary school would be beneficial to entertain. Uh, entertains a funny choice of words, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it w it's absolutely something we look at. Now, Dr. Doherty does have the superintendent's option of being able to try to place students in those schools where we can keep the numbers well, even. Well, avoiding redistricting right. that one child to another school, maybe changing the lines. The it's absolutely a good lines. suggestion that we, we could relook at the lines, especially in light of the building that has gone on over oh, off of South Street. Is there a way West to Street? know the location of the kids that would be coming in at some point so that you could draw the lines? Well, that's what we've done. That's what we've been doing. 
if we each year it changes with the incoming kindergarten class. We try to create. You were just saying the census tends to be not accurate. So no, no, no. We use. When well, will you have the hard numbers? I guess is the. No, question. we well that's that's part of the reason why I need a decision because as soon as I get that decision, we will then start the registration process. Mm -hmm. Once we get the registration, you what we've done in the past is by the end of December, we have a pretty good idea of the numbers. Now those numbers tend to creep up over the year and then you have a lot of people that move into Reading during the spring. Um, but we have a pretty good understanding by early January of at least what the cohorts look like and where they are in the community. So that's what we've been doing um, the last few years. So we've already redrawn the lines for those kindergarten grades when they come in. But not for next year. Well, we don't yet. know who they are. We don't know who they are yet. Right. But we do that in January. Okay. Helpful. Thank you. Mildly. Yes. Have you thought about for next year just doing full day kindergarten for those children actually who need it to do a screening and to just offer it to the children coming from Rise and children that have been identified through a screening process? Would that, excuse me for interrupting, would that, would that be more towards the option number one, which is to have one full day per school just to make sure that we can accommodate any, any special needs? Is, is, is that what you're asking? I'm just saying, how would that work? Because you have a set number well, that you know. The screening doesn't happen until April. By that point, families need to, they need the I'm information ahead of time. Well, you'd have to right. change the Offer it only to the students who actually need it. And you'd probably have to have some, uh, you know, some idea of the children who are in the right. Defined by, what do you mean by you need it? Well, you, you do must, you must have to do some type of, um, Screening. I'm that, sure that's done in April. Right. That's done at the end of April. I don't know if you'd have to move that up in order to have your numbers earlier. If you'd have to do your screening earlier. Um, that'd be pretty difficult to do earlier because students, uh, children develop at all different ages. I'm just saying, this so. Yeah. Yeah. I heard the brainstorm, which was, it, yeah. if I could yeah. almost repeat it, it's almost like, listen, we're going to have one kindergarten classroom next year to accommodate. Um, those students that uh, that, that need, need. Uh, of course I, I understand the suggestion I'm noting it perfect thank you mrs. Borowski just a quick comment to that I think I um, again appreciate the um, brainstorming I think a challenge with that I know that at rise preschool we have to have a 51% balance so right. I don't believe you are allowed to only put students who have special needs in a classroom. They need to have most, many of them, um, many of them have IEPs that specifically require them to be around um, oh. their general education peers mm -hmm. for um, a whole variety of very sound and good educational reasons. So I, that's one challenge, I think. Just that. Sometimes that those are high risk families. It may not necessarily be children that are special needs, oh, but okay. there, are actually, there actually are children that could benefit from the full day. That are they're considered high risk, not academically, but then for I other reasons. Your comment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I I know that it's not an ideal situation what's going on at Joshua Eaton right now where they're um, they're integrating it, but what, have you guys? I just came from Winchester where um, all of the kindergartens are all full day, and then kids that don't want to do it leave halfway through the day. So if you looked at the numbers and maybe raising the the ratio by adding a paraprofessional and seeing if you can balance it that way just for a couple of years and that way the kids who want to stay can stay and the kids that want to leave can leave. Sure. I, I, mean, I, I bet Dr. Doherty has a comment, but I want to make a comment. I hadn't heard that. I've heard that the integrated classrooms have been really well received through the district. Okay. So I just didn't know because you were saying kind of I, I, at the yeah, beginning it, of the it, night sorry, that it was like, oh, well, just so you know, like we had to do this and we had to hire. It made it sound like it was a negative thing. No, no, that's when the class size. Well, that's like, oh, it's kind of meaning. the class sizes. To but, well, that's what I'm trying to, that's I guess what I meant by integrated was that like the half day kindergarten in the full day or in, in one with higher numbers a little bit, adding a third paraprofessional, maybe it's not ideal. But so I, I, I guess I have a question, and then Mrs. Abbott, I'll, I'll, uh, the question becomes, if it's an integrated classroom, we still can't have more than that number, can we, Dr. Doherty? Or are you suggesting that, do our integrated classrooms today have 25 in the morning and 22 in just the afternoon? Just at Eaton. It's the only... Just at Eaton. Yeah, that... Okay. But we, but we try to keep, uh, we still try to keep it at 22. Okay. All right, that, I think that was the question, if we raised... 22 could you put another power of profession? Yeah, there is, is that, there is actually, a, there's only one state requirement on class size, and that's in kindergarten. You can't go higher than 25 across the district. 
Oh, but okay. you but, but you can go to 25 in the morning. You if could you had the, if you had the right personnel and the right room you, size. You and could. The stars were aligned. And things were happening. You could. I, yeah. Okay. You could. Mrs. Abbott. As someone who was on the first go round of the early childhood center working group, I was really shocked to see some of these options come out because we were moving forward. Um, the group is currently now still talking about fixing all of these issues we're talking about in the future. So as far as the lemonade comment goes, um, I'd like to make some lemonade and put trailers for the next year or two out. And then build or find the space that the working group is working on. But you know what? We all have to drink the lemonade. We all have kids going through this. And taking them out of a program that's full day right now at a preschool and telling them, well, you're only going to go to half day school now is really not going to help anything, including our test scores in the future. So that's my solution with lemonade. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand the whole lemonade thing, but I'm moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Knight? One, one, so one, it, on your point, I was, I was just going to mention that um, a portable classroom concept, uh, which we've used many times. Some of the schools may be lacking space to do that, but that said, is it feasible for us to look? I'm not a fan of, if we have a kindergarten curriculum and then we're asking um, private kindergartens to take over our students, uh, it doesn't seem like that would be uh, any continuity that we'd yeah. want to see. But that said, is, there, is it feasible to have, um, if we you know, couldn't necessarily um, you know, uh, come across uh, the funding to, to put in uh, uh, portable classrooms, is it feasible to maybe rent some space? I mean, hate so to go back to St. <laughs> Agnes School, but this is there's a whole, like you know. <laughs> no, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it off for a second. Uh, again, the working group is gonna start back yeah. on Wednesday night. Wednesday well, I'm they're talking about next year. Yeah, they're talking about next year. Yeah. We can actually. So I, I raised my hand. While I was talking. Um, we can direct the working group to look at options for next September. We can we can direct them to do what we want them to do. Um, we are, we are repeating ourselves a little bit. When we talked about Woburn Street School, we had a lot of families come up and say, well, wait a minute, I'm not driving my kid across school, and what about these kids, and how come I get to see my school, but I'm being put over there? We've had these conversations a lot. If we rent space, we're going to have those conversations again, and we're going to have those concerns. And again, it becomes what's best for the community and what's best for the families and what do they want. But it's a much longer conversation. Um, and it's a conversation that we've been having. So I don't, I'm not quite sure I had a point I'm, other than to say, we're looking at all options. Birch Meadow had portables uh, eight years ago, nine years ago they had portables and they finally removed them and people did the same clapping when we removed them. Um, and if we need to put them back, we absolutely will put them back. Not, not, we're not, those, gonna not the same. We're not gonna call them <laughs> portables. We're gonna call them modular classrooms and they look beautiful. And we've already seen examples of what they can look like and we're already trying to figure out where we can put them at Eaton and where we can put them at all of our schools. We're absolutely having these conversations. Can I go this way and then that way? Can we hear this? So I just want to be really clear about the lemonade because I don't want people to think that I'm not incredibly serious about this. And the lemonade was referring specifically to when a child, if, you, if we have the lottery and you don't get in and the child, you decide you're going to go to another school you know, be work on the resiliency side of it, work on the positive side of it. That was my comment. We're here talking about this, and I don't want you to think that we just can't figure out how to get out of our own way, um, and that we just like talking about this for three years on end. I mean, I just feel like this was a repeat. I came back to the school committee after a four-year absence, and we're talking about the same thing. So the reason we're talking about it, and the working group is meeting, on Wednesday is because when we went to town meeting, we were not successful. We did not successfully and, and adequately prepare the community to embrace this need. They were not behind the concept of full day K and the, and the preschool issues that roll into how do we move forward. So that's gonna, that we're gonna go at that again and all of us are reticent that we're here having this dialogue having to make this tough choice between you know the 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 best of the least desirable uh, option so I know every member of this committee is you know committed to doing our best to making sure that that working group process 
um, has a completely different outcome. But I, I'm not going to be unafraid to say we need your support then also at town meeting, whether you're a town meeting member for a year or 10 years or 20 years, or you just come to town meeting and you sit behind the checkers and you can be acknowledged to speak and you can give your voice to what's important to you in this community because it is town meeting that votes the budget. It is the budget that controls what we can do with space, what we can do with a modular classroom. Um, so when, when, remember, when we did these construction projects, it was a commitment to never again have portables and make sure we had, you know, music and art classrooms. And um, so, you know, this discussions in this community about portables or modulars, if you want to spin it as a modular being a different, better thing, are going to be tricky also. So we, you know, we need to keep focused on what's best for the students you're bringing, but we need you to also really be part of that budget process. Thank you. Yes? Um, hi, my name is Erin Gaffin, and I have three children. I have a third grader at Eaton. I have a kindergartner in the oversized classroom at Eaton, and I have a two-year-old who will be impacted by these decisions down the line. So I feel very much in the thick of all of these hot button issues right now. Um, my question is, it sounds like a lot of you are going back to number two on here, and number two, to the best um, of my understanding, sounds like what we're doing now, um, because there are three classrooms in every school now. Um, how could going with number two prevent what happened with this year's Joshua Eaton Kindergarten, which is that we have two classrooms of 24 and a classroom of 25, and you keep referencing private kindergarten. Well, I happen to know there are some kids in private kindergarten who plan to join that class for first grade next year, not all of whom can be redistricted. So that class is only going to get bigger, which is why I clap for portables, because I think they need a fourth classroom next year, and they're not going to get it from the outgoing fifth grade. Um, so to go back to my original question, if we go with num if you go with number two, um, how does it prevent what you let happen at Joshua Eaton this year from happening again, and how does it actually help our space issues? Dr. Jordan? So, um, essentially you'd only have one full day kindergarten classroom there. Everything else would be half day. Number two. No, number two. What, number two? Well, three classrooms. You have three classrooms, one will be full day, and then you'd have four half day classrooms. Four, four half day sessions. To manage the size. To manage the size. Them in the kindergarten year, I guess is my issue. Then they go to first grade, and you've still got to cram 25, 26 kids into a first day classroom. Are they going to have a para follow them for five years? Like, it's still, I, I feel like it's being short sighted to even only focus on the kindergarten year because I don't feel like it's helping classroom sizes down the line. Well, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I, I, and I said this that if we had an extra classroom, there, there would be four classrooms of kindergarten at Eaton this year. I, that's, that's the challenge that we're facing. I, you know, I, I believe it was Mr. Robinson that asked me this question during the summer. You know, do you have a solution? My only solution is to add paraeducator support to that classroom. You know, we're, we're, we are, our hands are tied when it comes to the space issue. I'll add that uh, these three options are just talking points. So there, there's no motion on the floor to accept one, two, or three. This is a conversation, and Dr. Doherty is providing some examples. So two things. I, I guess I, I wanted to say that so that I could say the following. I thought those were three full-day classrooms in each school. So I'm really glad you asked the question. I had misinterpreted option number two. So I'm, I'm glad for the dialogue. No, it's three. No, it says three kindergarten classrooms. I know. So I, I, yeah. I misinterpreted it. I honestly thought it meant three full-day. what we have now. Which is I what we have now. So I mis I misinterpreted. So that. Right. Is that worth repeating? So yes. when I read option two, you meant to see that's the case. Yeah. yeah, it's a combination. Okay. What's different than what they have right now? May I ask one question? Sorry, and Mrs. Friday, you're next. Oh, wait, uh, they have three right there, right? It's not three it's integrated. Three. It could be. Oh, okay. Could be. So it it. It depends. Me. See, I, I'm being dense, but so four. it could be three full day kindergartens oh, four classrooms. with those three kindergartens being an integrated environment where uh, half the day it's for half day kids right. they leave 
and the full day guys. It could be. It could be. Yeah, the integrated is all dependent upon numbers. Uh, if you have a very that. small nope, number I, of half day students and a large number of full day students, that's where the integrated sure. would be I, the best I, option. I heard you say one full day kindergarten and I got confused. I just wanted to try no, to No, I was stay. just using that as an example Perfect. for her answer. Understood completely. You're saying it's like 75% of an incoming kindergarten class at one particular school like Eaton wants oh, full day. Okay. Oh, I get you. You would take that and say, okay, we're only going to give it to 25% and we're going to make four half-day classes no, when I nobody I wants I it? I didn't say that. It, you it, did. It, you I said you would do full one full day okay. and four half-day. We didn't speak specific numbers. It all depends on the numbers. I can't give you a firm answer because I don't know the numbers. Ideal situation of an integrated classroom at a school is when you have a high number of full-day students and a low number of half-day students. That's when your integrated would work best because you maximize staffing and you maximize space. So that's the best scenario I can give you. That's, that's what I'm trying to explain. I, I have a question, please. This has been very good dialogue, so I hope we kind of keep this going. Uh, you had anticipated 300 children for next year. Yeah, I, I, I know, wouldn't I bet know, on that. Shot number, in the dark, yes. 300. <laughs> right. I, I'm going to use, because you guys have all seen my math skills, I'm going to use 20. Right, so that's 60 children per, uh, per school. So three classrooms, 20 kids each, 60 kids per school, five schools, 300 kids. Yep. Right? Problem solved. Uh, if, if they all are nicely divided among the so five no one, communities. So no one sells their houses. <laughs> <laughs> no one goes into the superintendent's office. I have the power within two miles, and I think that's an important point. We do, we do the best we can, and I think the numbers show that. We have tried to keep the numbers balanced across the district. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not easy. I mean, Linda and I, we get phone calls all the time, and we have to figure out, okay, where do we put this child? You know, I hate doing that because I'm, I'm making decisions that are going to be a five-year decision, you know, outside of that child's district. You know, so, but we have to do it because we don't have any other way of balancing those class sizes. <coughs> But, you know, she brought that up earlier, but where would we bus? Because the numbers are all pretty balanced. But wouldn't this get a hundred and something less kids in? No, you're not looking at class size. So we have to balance by class size, not the number of students in the school. It's not the number of students in the school that matters. It's how many are in each class that matters. I made it till 9.15 before I totally lost control of the meeting. So if we could kind of go back to <laughs> raising hands. And, again, this has been very respectful, and we're all trying to get to the same exact point, I assure you. Mrs. Frado, did you have your hand up? Okay. Um, I have a couple of things all around the board. You've asked, answered a lot of the questions. Um, the module is, I mean, it's a different time now. So, I mean, back in the day, and everyone voted on no modulars and this and that and the other thing. It's different. This is what we have to do. This is what you need to do as a community. You talk about community and you want everybody to be together and you don't want to be anybody left out or the lottery and oh, this kid, that kid. I mean, it seems to me right now there's no solution. So to make a decision for next year is kind of, I don't want to say ridiculous, but you really don't have a good firm thing, as Jean said. Look into the future. See what's going to happen. Don't try to solve it by just changing it right now. If it's not broken right now and it seems to work the way it is, which I've had a kid last year who went through it and he didn't do full day and it was perfect. It worked. If you can get away with keeping it like this, why try to change it? Why don't you perfect what you're trying to do in the future and then you know, but the modulars, I mean, it is class sizes, I mean, and the modulars are a temporary solution. It's not something that's going to stay there. This is just to help with the problem that you're having now. So, um, and also, is there going to be a vote? Like, you talk about community. So, throw it out to the community. Put it in a voting thing. Let people vote on it. Let the community vote on it. You know, it don't, I mean, I know you guys are definitely in the town and town meeting, and you have to go with the um, budget. Um, I mean, some people don't go out and vote, some people do. But the communication between the town and the school committee, it needs to be more out there. It needs to be, I mean, unless you're on Facebook and you're in this group, and you're, but not a lot of people are. 
the communication with the school and the parents, it needs to be more. And the options, you can't go back. You, like the three options, you can't go back. I'm sorry. I mean, you're going to do what you're going to do, but that's my opinion. Um, can I comment before you continue? Sure. If that's okay. Uh, only because I, I, I hear the passion in your voice, and I get it. <laughs> I do. Um, I did want to make one comment on portables, which people kind of clapped for. In my opinion, I wish we could solve the problem without having to use the word portables. And when, and when the space committee has looked at the problem, so we're going to get two at Birch Meadow, right? We can wedge those two back in on the parking lot. We've looked at cases where we can put two more at Eaton and kind of wedge them in different spots. And this is taking us off it. But it's not really a permanent solution. It's a temporary solution. It, and uh, there's no price tag on our children. It's very expensive. These aren't trailers that they wheel in and set up and say, go for it. I mean, these are very expensive uh, pieces of whatever, construction. Uh, I, it, it would be too bad if we spent all of that money now only to finally get the town to kick in and say, great, now let's actually build the right solution. We just want to watch it all. We, we're kind of examining all of our points. Boy, that it st started good and then it faded. Go ahead, Dr. Dorn. Um, so, I, I don't know how many people have been um, watching this unveil over the last few years, but one of the things we did look at was portables, uh, modulus, sorry, modulus. Um, modulus do work at some sites. They don't work at all of the five sites because you don't have the space. So that, that's the challenge. <coughs> um, can we make it work? We probably could. It's going to require more extensive work. Um, but that was when we did look at modular classrooms. That was one of the options that we looked at when we were going through this whole process. And the challenge was, uh, particularly in the two schools that probably need the space right now the most, Can Eaton and Barrows, it was, a, it was a challenge to put modulars on that space. I'd like to make one comment. And Mrs. Fredo, I don't know if you were done, so you're more than welcome to continue. Um, it's my recommendation. The committee isn't taking a vote tonight. We're talking about it. We're thinking about it. We're not taking a vote on this this evening. So if there's concern in our audience tonight that, hey, they're going to vote on option three unless I do something, don't. But my recommendation is that we don't take a vote this evening, that we gather all of your feedback and that we listen and we come back probably at, at our November 3rd meeting? Because there's I not enough I on that I don't think agenda. you're going to have an opportunity on November 3rd. Right, I agree. But, but, uh, the, but it, 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 my recommendation to the committee is going to be that we reflect on what we've heard tonight we continue to listen, and we we come to a vote at a future meeting. I just wanted to throw that out there in case people were kind of thinking about the process. And you've had your hand up for a while. <laughs> um, I'm new to this whole school committee business, but uh, I guess I would like to understand what the push behind even presenting these other options is. Like, why does it exist? Did you have the same discussion last year? So this happens every year. You have to decide what. You're Not to do this intensity, but it happens every year. Okay. Because it, it seems like just the other one and two, three are just going completely backwards. Th this stuff. came about last year when we were having the whole space discussion. The committee said at the time, we're going to need to revisit in October. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do for the following year? Because we're not going to have the space. That's, so that's why it was discussed. Oh, I saw Yes, Mrs. Webb. Well, it's just a process yeah. question because I'm just trying to understand the timeline. I understand, okay, so it was nef nothing here that said we were going to take a vote on this, but I did hear us all talk, uh, uh, at least most of the committee members weighed in sort of in the direction of number two, given these three options. And I don't know what Dr. Darty's timing is in terms of, you know, beginning to move forward. And I want to make sure that we're cognizant of being able to give Dr. Darty a direction to move forward in in appropriate time frame so I just really want to make sure if uh, if we can't do that next meeting um, because that's because we have a very full agenda on the third can we do that on we have a meeting on the first can we do that on the first or then we have to wait till the 24th yeah, of I November wouldn't on, I wouldn't do it on the first so, okay. so I, I, I wouldn't have thrown out that we're not taking the vote had I not previously spoken with Dr. Doherty I, oh, I'm okay. full aware of, of the timeline. We're going to give Dr. Doherty what he needs to know, but, but I had never planned on taking a vote. Okay. I, I plan on moving forward with having the kindergarten meeting, mm -hmm. and you know we're, we're going to be sending that out soon. 
Okay. Um, the kindergarten meeting, I think, right now we're scheduling for mid-November. So if we could have the decision made by mid-November, that would be. But we're going to start publicizing that we're going to have a kindergarten meeting. So our to start our sending that out. Looking at our agenda, that our next scheduled meeting after the third, which I don't think we want to talk about on the third, would be the twenty-fourth of November. Yeah, I would recommend that we try to wedge a meeting. You schedule us that. another meeting. Yeah. Fine, that's fine, and but we can work together. When will we know the numbers? Them. Dr. Doherty, when, huh. when will we know the numbers? Ballpark. We won't know till like June, you think? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. We, we ask to get registrations in by the end of December. Okay. That gives us a pretty good number. Um, and then we do get, um, that's when we, we get stragglers. Thank you. We start getting stragglers in at that point. So we, it'll go up by another 25 to 50 students after that, usually. Um, but we get the bulk of the numbers in by the end of December, so it starts giving us a, an idea. What we do say is if you want full-day kindergarten, you have to turn it in by the end of December. Yes. I, I have a question that I realize might be more of a suggestion, because I really appreciate the discussion and, and what seems to be real consensus, that options one and options three are going backwards, and so that seems like the committee and the community doesn't really seem to be going there in terms of a favorable option. So it strikes me that if we focus on question two, the question may not be so much, okay, what do we do, but what do we do if and when there are more kids who want full day kindergarten? What do we do with those children? Do we do temporary and advocate in the finance process and the budget process, advocate for enough modulars? Do we say, no, you can't come? Do we do something offsite? That that might be, that might be even a more constructive question to say, what what will we do with the kids who can't get into full day kindergarten, for whom we don't have currently a space? Thank you. And uh, I, I don't know if you were a Dr. Doherty plant or not, but that's what Dr. Doherty is looking for from us to kind of say, what do we do with that? Yes, you had your hand up. Well, I was just trying to think outside the box and. Um, just for the one year for next year and then have the other kindergarten group do for the, you know, permanent solution. But, and this could be totally stupid, but who knows. I know you guys talked about on the committee having a school in the parking lot of the high school. Mm -hmm. Could you put portables there and bus kids over or something just for a year? I'm not saying forever. Um, it's just... It's an excellent suggestion. In fact, the working group uh, has had conversations about portables in the superintendent's parking lot right out here to accommodate rise and it could be done if we go that route there is space in front <coughs> of the superintendent's office if we were to put portables it, it's certainly something worth discussing it just seems like that would be a better option than three or one but mm -hmm. oh, okay. and also three. does half day this is off to, does half day kindergarten have to end at 11 like 11:30 11:30 like, you may have some people that if you extended the half day to 1 o'clock or something, they might not want full day, and then that might alleviate. I'm sorry. It and I'm with you, and I think I'm getting yeah, to it. Yeah, it it's a staffing it's issue. issue. Unless you wanted that afternoon classroom to go from 1 to, say, 4. Yeah. <laughs> right? I was <don't> <laughs> trying no to figure that out. would want to take the afternoon yeah. session. Yeah. <laughs> a, a budget question. Go. Uh, which and how do these impact your school budget then going into next year? Looking at these, just that you propose, what's the what's the budget impact on these? Well, you, right now we currently take an offset of I think it put eight hundred twenty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. So, so now of these now that would go impact. that would be reduced based on staffing because if you will go with option three, you have no full day. You would be reducing staff. You, you, right, you reduce your full day kindergarten staff and your offset. And your offset, and right. And your offset. And of the other two options, and what, what's, the bu what's the budget impact of these two between one and two? We've been doing it. I mean, the best thing I can tell you is, and we haven't had budget discussions yet, okay. it's an $825,000 offset. So you don't d distinguish at all between one and two? You would have less offset. No, less option more, it's in the, the memo there. It's less. It's a less. It's less of an offset. It would have to be less. For all of them. For, for both of them. Would, no, one would be less of an offset because you are going. You're essentially reducing two, your full day kindergarten population by fifty percent. Yeah. Yes, I know. 
You're only allowed to ask questions if they don't involve options one or three. <laughs> okay? Is that okay? Because uh, you guys, I was trying to get this on the agenda early. You guys can get out of here. Yes, you've been waiting patiently. Maybe this is a question that I'm just not aware of. Is where does the early education committee stand on their time frame of their ideas of when they would come to town vote is what I'm guessing well, it's, a, come it's a great question and I, I don't have an answer for that. Has there been any sort of a guesstimate on when the working committee I know I don't I, <laughs> see you got me in trouble. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sort of um, I might say that a lot of the members on that working group were on the previous working group, and all of the facts and all of the research they had done, they'll certainly have at their disposal. Um, nope. So I don't think they're starting from scratch, but they are starting Wednesday. Okay, I was aware. Is that so okay. realistically, I understand at right at this moment we're only talking about next year, but realistically we need to be talking about two, three, four years down the road, That's not just next year. Yeah. Absolutely. Realistically, we need to be talking about more years, not just a temporary solution for next year. Okay. I, so agree, I agree with your comment completely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then the other question that I had that I didn't understand fully, Dr. Doherty, was when um, someone brought up the question about redistricting. And I, do you redistrict every year, or do you re have, when was the last time you redistricted? Uh, 2005. But with the options that have been given to me, we take a look at the kindergarten group. We actually take a map and we put pins to where they live and we look to see where cohorts are and how far they are from a school and that's how and we, we look try to balance the class sizes. That's how we actually move with the incoming. And the other thing that, that's tricky and it, because the whole thing is look you also have to look are there siblings in that school because you can't move a child if there's a sibling in that school already so it's that's what we try to do when we're trying to balance these. But, and I don't know if people know this, there are no other classrooms available in other schools. So you really can't redistrict to another school if you don't have any space over in those schools. Um, so that's the challenge. Sorry to interrupt you. It's an interesting point as well, though. We talked about hurt feelings with the lottery. There's also hurt feelings when we have to tell yes. the Joneses that their kid is going to... Uh, you know, I'm not on town committee. But if we redistricted and then people were going to other schools and they know their neighbors are going to other schools, it's going to make things a little easier, even if they're not going necessarily to their neighborhood school. I think that's going to that would make a difference and maybe you could even out some of the numbers, Indeed. which I know is also right. difficult to force. For you can't tell who's going to live in that house or may who may sell or who may buy or build or whatever. But I mean. The numbers in certain parts of the town seem to be so much higher than in other parts of the town. But they're built to take more students. What? Eaton and Killam are the two biggest schools because they have the most classrooms. Okay. But their numbers still No, but they have more classrooms. And I, I, I think, and I'm, I'm trying not to, but what you need to look at is not the population of the school. The pop what you need to look at is the class sizes. Because okay. that's the key. Mm -hmm. You can have a large school, but if your class sizes are 18 to 22, that's, your, that's what you want. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But redistricting isn't going to solve the problem because you don't have any place to move the students. There are no other classrooms available. Okay. Right. It would be interesting if Woodend only had 12 kids going to their school, which in years past we've had things like that, that'd be great. But the problem is, is we have such an even distribution of students across the entire district. Right. Yes, I'm correct. I'm just saying it again. Right now. Mrs. Abbott had her hand up for so long. I just have one more question. Sure, no, go ahead. We've seen a lot of issues, class sizes, not enough special education, cutting music and arts, and our only response to adding capacity for modulars that may or may not add state federal funding and also increase the full day tuition revenue is that they're expensive. It seems like it's the least of many evils. I'm not saying they're perfect. I know people are going to be upset. They don't want to see them. But it's, it's temporary and it adds full day revenue, right? And if we comply, we get more funding for all of our programs and we have the option to take back music and art. Yeah, we can argue all day about where the modular is going to go and 
who's going to have to drive to them, but do you want to answer to someone who has to drive their kids across town to full day kindergarten or their special ed classes or tell them, we don't have them, we're sorry, try again next year? The, we're not opposed to <laughs> modular classrooms. We I aren't. A lot of people are. I'm just saying I've been I, on the working I, I think I think those parents say. that are opposed to modular classrooms remember the trailers. Yeah. Right. We're not right. we wouldn't be proposing that regardless. So I don't think you're going to get parents saying, Oh, my kid isn't going in there. In fact, mm -hmm. you're probably gonna get fights to get who in there because they're gonna be beautiful and new. Um, we can absolutely ask the working group to look at a short term option and as well as the permanent solution. That's absolutely something we can direct them to do. Um, is it okay if I go back this way? Because you had had your hand up earlier. Um, oh, you did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it was more a comment to the redistricting and the really to look at the class size. My understanding yep. was that Josh Wheaton did have across the board the largest class size. Just in kindergarten and fifth grade. Look, if you look at the class sizes, they're, they're they got a 25 and 4. No, those, those are 23s. If you spread them out, they're 23s. I mean, plus or minus one or two students? Yeah, yeah. I, I see the, I see the, I see the kindergarten in the fifth grade at Eaton. Is that what you guys see? Yeah, I, it was actually in the old budget information that I don't think I have with me that was showing the um, average class sizes of Joshua Eaton being the largest. So it may have been those, those are the latest numbers. So it's in the okay. packet tonight are the latest numbers. Do they, do they seem off from what you had earlier seen? I, I've always meant to kind of stack these up and look at them as we get them. But it was actually the number of like the student-teacher ratio. I think that was oh. where Joshua Eaton had the highest. Number. Right, that's not class size. Okay. So student-teacher uh, ratio is when you take all of the professional staff in a building and you divide it by the number of students. That's not class size. It, class size is what you want. That's what you want to look at. That's the true number. And when you talk about that student to teacher ratio, do you mean the primary teacher or do you mean all? No, you include music, art, music, music. PE, okay, um, okay. School, school psychologists. Psych you include all of those okay. staff. They don't have, they're not a classroom teacher, but you include that when you calculate a student I've been teacher looking ratio. At the student the DESE website calculates it as student teacher ratio and not class size. Understood, thank you. Mrs. Frada? Short and sweet. Better be. Basically, it seems like your ideas go great. Not really going to work for next year, like someone else said. You know, think of forward. I think timeline right now, you're really pushing it between now in what January getting and all this stuff and um, oh well, I just had one more thing I was going to say it was going to be easy um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, what was it oh my gosh wait how is it um, I don't know I don't really remember I'm sorry depending sorry. on how I feel later I'll come back to sorry. you sorry right? <laughs> yes just uh, I'm sorry she I'm was sorry, just another quick question so if the numbers are I know you said they're not maybe necessarily um, correct but if the numbers are in the 300s, it, this could be a moot point. It could be. Sure. Wouldn't that be awesome? Just, okay, just yeah. carry it. Oh, yeah. It, 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 unfortunately, we're, we don't know. The, I wish I could look at a crystal ball and say, oh, it's no, 300. It. But if, if, if they're, so essentially, if they're in the lower than what they are now, it could be a moot point. Yes. For the most part, okay. Yes. Oh, well, I was just wondering, um, I know I'm basically here just because option one and particularly option three frightened me so much that I felt the need to show up and, you know, try to represent. Um, but I know to Mrs. Webb's point that you need us at town meeting. Um, how do we know when town yeah. meeting is? Oh, like, I got, want to be at oh, town well. meeting. <laughs> so, but do I go to the wait. website or? Okay, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Well, I'm the one right away. <laughs> No, and that's it for the question and the answer period for this Great evening, okay? <laughs> Town meeting. At least, so okay. at least <laughs> get started. It is, it's the last page. We had made rules, though. We're not going to talk about options one and options three anymore. <laughs> okay. I assure you that that is not a direction that I'm going to be at all in favor of. It's going to be something else. So I apologize if that went out to the public and everyone read that and said, oh, my God. So I apologize for that, but that isn't a direction we're thinking yeah, about I heading. Think that's like 
how okay. this happened. Yeah. Yeah. We're learning. Uh, We're learning. Dr. Doherty, I, I, and I'm, I don't mean to throw you under the bus. I, you're no, just, I, uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw myself under the bus. Okay. So <laughs> my role is to present options to the school committee. And then, you know, if the school committee asks me for my recommendation, I give them a recommendation. I have to give all options because then they need to have that discussion. I don't want to sway the conversation either way. So, you know, the, the fact that the options are out there doesn't mean that I support these options. Because, I mean... Reading it, I believe, like, they right. must be thinking option two, but it was like, <laughs> why are one and three even um, really, particularly three? Because I think to show full it. transparency that those are the ones that are out there, and there could have been people here this evening saying, why aren't you looking at this, or why aren't... That's why my role is to put them all out there. doesn't mean I support them. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Webb. <laughs> Thank you. So, and the reason those options are there is because there were, there were people at town meeting last spring, fall, whatever it was, who basically were saying, we don't need this. We actually had somebody say, full day K is the kids are taking a nap. Okay, so, so you know, I think we we're, and we need to be fiscally responsible. That's an important part of you know any town committee you're on, school committee, whatever. We've got to be fiscally responsible and meet the need. So, uh, in terms of if if anyone wants more information at town meet about town yeah, meeting, I wonder, like, if, we, if we would know what meetings would be right. on the agenda. For. Well, this we November. Agenda, yeah, we November the warrants. There's a town meeting warrant, and certainly we are always talking about sort of what what are um, you know what the issues are at town meeting. But you can feel free to email me. I'll help you yeah, out absolutely. in terms of getting involved. We nominate Mrs. Webb. She can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has questions about town meeting, so, they can email. Absolutely. Me. Yeah. And m the majority of us on the school committee are all of us. Town meeting, meeting members. Yes. All of us yeah. on the school committee are on town meeting, which gives us a vote when it comes to our budget and the direction of the town. So it's Yeah, there was a way you could get information out to us at the time you needed support or there was like a vote. Mrs. Webb is going to have actually have you run for <laughs> <laughs> because non town yeah. meeting yeah. members. Non town can't meeting talk. vote. Okay, really well, good idea. Yeah, no, we'll, talk. we'll do it. Right. No, yeah. we, we will absolutely let you guys okay. we will absolutely we know. Can I can do that. We can organize and we can make a stand. Mm -hmm. This is really important. <laughs> Last, last comment is, Promise. I think it was a real flash of brilliance to put out option one and three and get it brought up. You, you have all the <laughs> 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 and, and in all serious, to the point of organizing, you know, this is something that I've wanted for a long time. My child, my children have gone to all-day preschool. You know, the idea of taking my all-day, my, my five-year-old out of all-day preschool and putting him in half-day kindergarten, I don't know what he would do. So there are a lot of people who care about this, and I even found that the meetings, for someone who was really caring about this, the information that came out in advance of town meeting wasn't as compelling as I even wanted it to be. A lot of the information that's been provided about the increase in demand, anything that we can do, and I think you have a lot of people who are willing to help, I personally am willing to help, to help get information out into the community, get it into the preschools. There are a lot of writing families for whom this is not even on their radar screen because their first child is three years old and they are really busy. But there are a lot of people who can help get that information out, and, and I know we are really willing to help. Well, one comment, please. Um, it's not, it's not my style and it's not the committee style to do the shock factor of getting people in. So I don't want you to think for even a second. I was thinking okay, second. Okay, one and three weren't put on here. <laughs> a, a few years ago when we had some severe budget issues, we said things like, well, we're going to cut hockey. And, and it was, it's silly. So no, that isn't our intention to do anything like this. Uh, to, to, it isn't our intention to try to shock or scare you into coming here like that. Yes. That is really compelling, good information, and what, that, that can be easily, I think, presented out to the community, especially in comparison to all of our neighboring towns. People are concerned about the real estate values. There's a lot of good information within here that can be put out without the shock value. Thank you very much. You've been very patient. Thank you. Um, I actually think that I agree with you, and I was completely blown away at town meeting with the lack of support for full day kindergarten and the early childhood options. Mm -hmm. Completely blown away. And so I think one of the keys <coughs> that you've mentioned um, is the communication piece. And I did not mean to be rude, but I put down sign them up. Because 
I think we need to get the word out and maybe it would be helpful for the Early Childhood Working what? Committee to have a list of people that are willing to get the word out to their community. Like we have budget parents. I'd like to plant the seed for that because I saw that look. <laughs> but the, um, for the, the budget parents, they're part of the figuring out what goes on in the school and how the money is spent. But they're also the communication vehicle to the rest of the town. So when we have budget parents that are reporting back to their PTOs in their different schools, that's another way to get our fingers out, to get the information out, because what we truly, I speak for me, what I truly want is pe people to have access to the information and be engaged because of this, because of these kinds of discussions that can be productive and yeah. we're all in it for the okay. kids and the families and the community. So I thank you all for being here, and I do hope that, um, I don't know legalities, but if we can have a sign-up sheet for who is here and then provide that to the working group to get the word, you know, so there are concrete people to talk to about getting the word out. Because we were criticized for not getting enough word out early enough on, in the past, despite efforts. So. I, I did a sheet, nope. and it'll yeah, be outside when you leave if you want to sign up. And Mrs. Borowski, did you have your hand up? Incredibly quick point, but I, I, I just want to make it clear that that working group that's meeting Wednesday for the first time, and there are some, some people who've been at this for a long time and some new faces too, one of the mandates of that group, in addition to looking at the space, is communication. Mm -hmm. It's actually listed as how do we let people know that these meetings are happening? How do we let people know that there are open meetings? You can come. You can step up and say, I want this, I want this, I don't like that. How do we do exactly what you're describing? So that is actually one of the things that our group is going to tackle is the communication piece. So stay tuned. Dr. Doxer. I actually have a technical question because I don't like whispering. So um, I know I was planning to go, because it's an open meeting for the Early Childhood Working Group, um, and I was planning to go, and all of a sudden I realized, is it okay for there to be a quorum of the school committee members there, or do we have to sign up with our wonderful chair to make sure that we don't have a quorum there? I thought you'd know the answer. You know, it's a I good do question know because two members are in the two, uh, right. group. Right, so are we allowed? So they're part of that group. I can't make it that many. Oh. I have, I'm not going to go. I know. We, we've got a so lot of really um, uh, great people that have signed up and dedicated people to sign That's up. Uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, and I'm not, I'm not saying anyone that you shouldn't go. I'm telling you that um, the list of people that are on that committee are varied and experienced and smart and are student focused and I have complete confidence in what they're going to come back in. Uh, the school committee cannot have a quorum at that meeting. I can check, but I don't plan on going. So if, if, as long as Mr. Nine wasn't planning on attending, um, then we're all set with a quorum and we're welcome to button. attend. Sorry, well, I have another okay. person that I know and live with who's going to be on the committee. So if Mr. Nine wants okay. to go, then I could get my report later. That's all right. My husband's go. on the <laughs> <laughs> um, Shack it up. <laughs> this has been in incredibly useful. I, I hope that you guys felt as though you had a voice. Uh, again, we're not going to take any action until uh, until that sometime no, in November. No, we said we were going to come up with another, another, day. another meeting day. Uh, there's a town meeting in between. I will absolutely make sure that the community is aware of when we're going to bring this topic back up. If you have questions, you can send any of us email. Um, or call us or any way that uh, is best for you to communicate. So I hope this was helpful. I thank you for all of your, uh, all of your questions and feedback. Thank you. And we thank you. There is an email, a sheet if you want to drop yes. your email you to get clap. information about town meeting and the working group. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The meeting's still going to go on, but apparently <laughs> <laughs> you're going to just Sorry. leave. I don't <laughs> You just us and the reporter then, huh? They can fast forward on YouTube. Absolutely do your presentation, but I'm going to table the rest of the agenda items for this evening. Wait, do we have to I vote on the, the field, field trips? trips uh, approved. Yeah, we'll approve the field trips, but we won't do the, we'll sorry. Vote. Uh, yeah. We're going to have a quick change in our agenda. Um, I'm going to ask that we uh, not discuss the second oh, reading policies. of the student field trips or the bullying prevention. Um, we are going to have the coordinated program review presentation. We are going to approve some field trips. And then we're going to get out of here as quickly as we Donation. can. Donation. Yep.
Oh, oh, Miss, oh, did you have your hand up, Mrs. Downer? No. So, Sorry. I mean, I what's going on here? Sorry. You don't have to worry about the word being spread about anything, maybe, because we have the, these Facebook parent groups that every time you guys no. have an agenda, I post it. So that's you have not a Facebook credit group? for everybody here, but I, I like to spread the word. I had no idea Thank that you, you had a Facebook group. <laughs> really? Wow. That hasn't I consumed mean, my life for the past three months. Um, great. great. Thank you very much, Mrs. That'd Downing. That is helpful. Right, Mrs. Wilson, I'm sorry We're to keep you waiting, and thank you for being so patient. Uh, you know what, Mrs. Wilson, yeah. could we take two quick minutes, and that will allow you to get set up, and some committee yeah. members can just stretch their legs for a moment. So we're going to take two minutes. Mrs. Wilson, thank you so much for being patient this evening. No problem. The floor so is I the no. Nope, you're not going to stumble. <laughs> the floor is yours. Welcome. Great. So I was going to do an overview for you all on a couple of the special ed pieces. I was going to talk a little bit about the entry plan work that I've been doing since I started in July. Some special ed basic information for you as a school committee, and then go over the coordinated program review and kind of next steps around that. So I believe you've received a copy of the coordinated program mm -hmm. review and had a chance to look at that. So. So I'm just going to start with a little bit about the entry plan. So I started on July 1, and um, prior to that, I had written an entry plan, which sort of outlined some steps I would take to get to know the district. Um, and there's a lot of work for me to do day in and day out on top of the entry plan, but I've been reviewing student records, reviewing policy and procedures. I've been meeting with parents. On Thursday evening, I will be having a CPAC meeting as a meet and greet with myself and the team chairs. I've interviewed building principals, interviewed team chairs, I've had interviews with central office administrative team, I've been out observing buildings, doing walkthroughs, seeing what's happening in the buildings, interviewing staff, I've asked um, principals to kind of schedule time for me to be there and tell me what they'd like me to see, who they'd like me to meet with. I've interviewed special ed staff, I've interviewed general ed staff, and I've done a survey that went out to all the staff um, in the Reading Public Schools to just had about five or six questions. Tell me what are strengths, what are weaknesses, what would you like to see me do in my role? Um, so I have all of that information that I'm gathering. Um, so what am I going to do with it? I'm really looking to identify some trends. I'd like to identify priority items and create some action steps with shareholders. So sometime in December, I'd like to start with the CPAC, with the team chairs, with the administrative team to take all that information to really then create action steps, which actually comes in line with budget season. So <laughs> hoping that'll all work to out together. Mm -hmm. So what is special education? I thought it would really be helpful to just talk a little bit about it. Um, knowing that a big percentage of my job is spent overseeing special education, and I also oversee ELL, 504, nursing, guidance, let's see, um, McKinney-Vento, seeing if I'm missing anything. What is that? Uh, that's a, for our homeless. Homeless transportation. Well, I, think that's, I think that's all of my things. But the majority of my time is spent overseeing the special education process here in Reading. So these are just some basic beliefs about special education and really I think it's important for us to remember that we really want to see all children meet with success in the district and these are some common beliefs about that. Um, most of the work around special ed as you know is governed by a lot of laws and a lot of regulations that dictate everything that we do. They influ influence how we allocate resources, they implement how our teachers work day in and day out. Um, and they really just kind of flavor everything we do. So these are a few of the laws and related um, regulations that impact the work that we do in special education. We have the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Chapter 766 with the 603 CMR 2800 regulations. We have the Massachusetts Ed Reform Act, Section 504, Section 688, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and FERPA. All of these things influence the work that we're doing day in and day out in special education. Um, one of the things we've talked about and you heard about was the MTSS piece. So you'll see the laws that we have impact that process. We're supposed to have kind of old language was pre-referral. Now we're moving to this idea of MTSS or response to intervention where we are taking steps to create a strong 
core curriculum and then tiers of intervention so that when we we've provided all children with the supports we think they need and then we're kind of culling out this child we suspect has a disability so through having what we call a curriculum accommodation plan we identify strong interventions for all students and how we support all learners in our schools um, the other impacts we have we have a lot of protections around discipline which i know you're familiar with for students with ieps and 504s we have to ensure that our children on IEPs receive a free, appropriate public education. And I'll talk a little bit more about that further on. Um, circuit breaker, a big piece. And then the other regulatory requirement is that fiscal impact, we can never use that as a factor in making determinations. So although I have a fiduciary responsibility, when decisions are made regarding what a child with a disability requires to access and make progress in the curriculum, I can't say it's due to lack of funds. Okay, so I think that's a really important piece. Um, so who can refer, what is the referral process? Any adult can make a referral for an evaluation. As a district, we then have five school days to respond to the request for an evaluation, and we have to receive a consent form from the parent um, in order to evaluate a child. So early intervention is a referral source that we receive referrals from teachers, grandparents. Ultimately, the parent has to consent. Um, when can referrals be made? Anytime. We receive referrals all summer. We receive referrals all school year. So at any point, we can receive a referral. What does an evaluation consist of? So once we receive a consent to evaluate, our evaluators then, we base our evaluations on what the area of suspected disability is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll receive a email, a letter saying, I want my child evaluated for special education. It is the team chair's job to flesh out what is the suspected disability. And then based on that, what are the evaluations that we're going to conduct? So a parent says, well, I think my child has articulation errors. Okay, we're gonna do a speech and language evaluation. We may do some observation of that child. We're required on any student, we have to do what's called an educational assessment, okay, which is done by the classroom teacher. Um, it's a form we fill out that has a series of questions. That's a required evaluation, and um, we are required to do typically an observation. <coughs> All the other evaluations we do, like psychological, speech and language, OT, PT, assistive technology, academic achievement, those are all optional evaluations based on the area of suspected disability. And evaluations, depending on the child's age, what the areas of concerns are can take anywhere from the evaluator anywhere from two hours of face time to eight hours of face time with that student and then it's going to take about that same amount of time to analyze the results write up a comprehensive report where does the evaluation occur evaluations occur in our schools so we have families who homeschool we have families whose children are placed in private schools they come to us for those evaluations and they typically occur in the same space where like a speech pathologist would service um, a student and as i said how long does it take depending on what the area of concern is anywhere from about two to eight hours of face time with a student plus time to analyze results and write reports our timelines once we receive a signed consent form from a parent we have 30 school days to complete the evaluation. And then we have a 15 day window where we have to convene a team and determine whether or not that child is eligible and then propose something. So we have a total of 45 school days from the time we receive an evaluation consent form. That's a pretty. Can I ask a yes, you can, Ms. Smith. A question. So, um, can, um, in regard to doing evaluations for students who are homeschooled or private schools? Yeah. So does that mean someone who's going to a private school, not like a placement, not, a, mm -hmm. not one of our kids that's on an on a, yep. out of district placement, but somebody who chose not to come yep, to like the public Saint school? Yeah, Joseph, Saint. Okay, and, um, but then the parent suspects, or, or the school says, yep, we, think there's a disability. we think there's an issue, go to the public school yep. and get evaluated? Yes. 
and we have we and we do every have to do that evaluation yep. yes and there's no co no charge no. and then provide the service and then we may have to provide the service if they're eligible even if they're not attending the school Correct. otherwise because they are a resident and they're paying <coughs> taxes yes and they're resident Oh, right. Wilson, uh, about how many of these evaluations do you perform a year? Um, I don't have a total number. I'm actually looking to start capturing data on month by month the number of referrals. Initial referrals, I'd like to get a sense of how mm -hmm. many we re receive from parents and how many re we receive through what we, the SST process that we talked about. So I'm trying to capture that data this year. Okay. Um, That's but right. it's something Thank I'm you. looking to gather more on. So. In, in regards to determining eligibility, so now we've done this evaluation, we have these great reports that our staff write, we make them available to families to review in advance of the meeting. So a team comes together and that team has four questions that they need to answer in order for a child to be eligible. So the first question is do they have a disability? And our disability definitions are educational disabilities that are based on the law. They are, we're not clinicians, they are not based on the DSM-5 criteria. We have certain criteria that are outlined in Massachusetts about what is considered a disability. So that's the first question. Second question we need to answer, is the student making effective progress in school? So the team needs to look at how the child is performing both academically, socially, how they're accessing the life of the school. Are they making progress? The third question is, is the lack of progress a result of their disability? So you have to tie in that they're not making progress mm -hmm. as a result of the disability. And then the fourth question, which is the most important, is do they require specially designed instruction or a related service in order to access the curriculum? So it's not just you have a disability, it's not just it would be nice, if you had this, it is do you require specially designed instruction <coughs> or related service to access the curriculum? So that is that piece where it says what is special education? It's the specially designed <coughs> instruction that only a special ed teacher can provide. It's a different type of methodology for teaching, a different group to be in that is taught in a specialized manner. Not just reteaching the same piece, but that we're using something different to teach those children. And that they require that in order to make progress. So some of the basic principles, we have to have parent-student participation, we need to provide a free appropriate public education, we need to do appropriate evaluations, we need to ensure we develop an IEP for those students who are eligible, we need to think about the least restrictive environment for educating our students, and we need to make sure that we're always providing parents with their procedural safeguards so that they understand what rights they have in this process. Um, as I said, parents need to be very involved in this process. Um, they kind of, they're active participants as we go through this. Um, the free appropriate public education standard, this is one that I always like to clarify. Um, it doesn't mean maximum benefit. What it's come down to for us is that we're required to pro provide a program that is reasonably calculated to ensure a meaningful benefit not about the best, it's about something that allows for the child to have some sort of meaningful benefit. Um, so we talked about evaluations and the timelines. Our job is to make sure we have a comprehensive evaluation because it gives us information on the child and it helps us plan for them moving forward. Um, an IEP, if a child is found eligible, we develop this plan. It's a contract with us between the school district and the parent, and this has to outline goals, service delivery, accommodations and modifications, and all the staff who are working with that child are required to be implementing what's written on that plan. Um, least restrictive environment. Students with disabilities are entitled to be educated alongside their non-disabled peers to the greatest extent possible. As an IEP team, the team is charged with considering and discussing why they need to remove a child from the general ed setting anytime, even if it's for a 30 minute pullout, they need to have a justification in that IEP why it's critical that that child is removed from the general ed setting. Um, as I said, parents have the first and final say, so we can't act upon anything that we propose as a district without parental consent. 
and we need to make sure that we're providing them with their procedural safeguards, which explains what their rights are periodically. Um, additionally, there's different processes for dispute resolution, so we can <coughs> access mediation or a hearing. The district can initiate that. Parents can initiate that. Um, mediation is non-binding, um, and a due process hearing is a full legal court proceeding. Um, these are some of the supports that we have available here in Reading. So we do have related service. We offer occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapy, counseling. Um, I didn't put on here some of our consulting services. We have assistive technology consultation. We re receive consultation from board certified behavior analysts who support some of our students. Um, we have other specialized people who do some consultation. We have special education teachers who service kids in and out of the classroom. And then these are the programs that when we talk about them, we have the student support program that is, low, is elementary through high school. We have the integrated learning program, which again is elementary through high school. The developmental learning center. We have a new program called Compass that is housed at Coolidge. And we have the language learning disabilities program. And then we have the therapeutic support program, which is only at the high school. <coughs> so, coordinated program review. So we're required to go through this process because the state, state, in order to report to the federal government, has to show that they're doing this oversight of school districts. So every, at least every three years, they're required to come in. So at the six-year point, we receive a comprehensive, coordinated program review. And then at the three-year point, they come in and do a mid-cycle review. Mm -hmm. In the mid-cycle review, they only look at the areas we were cited, plus any new laws and regulations that have come out. <laughs> I say that lightly because there's always something new within that three-year time frame. Um, so we just had a coordinated program review. I can't take credit for what happened because I wasn't here. So that was in February. So this is just a review of what happened. Um, the areas that they reviewed, they looked at special education and their focus is on compliance. So I think it's really important to remember that their focus in looking at this is our compliance with state and federal regulations. Mm -hmm. They looked at civil rights and they looked at the English language, English learner education section. So they, this is what was reviewed, which you can look at that information of what they reviewed. The district prior to them coming on site did a self-assessment um, and submitted information to the department that they reviewed prior to coming on site. So this is more of what they reviewed and what did they find? In special ed, it's great news. We had three areas of non-compliance. Um, and they were all partially, everything we have here is partially implemented. So it means that, that means we had some evidence towards it, we just weren't fully implemented. So that's a good thing. Um, the areas in special ed that we were cited on, we had, um, remember I talked about least restrictive environment. So one area is that we didn't do a great enough job justifying as teams why we're removing children from the general education setting. Um, the other issue we had is for some students, they found that we had some gaps in um, providing services, whether that was because staff members weren't available on a medical leave or other things. And so we need to do a better job communicating to families when we haven't provided those services. And then the last one was that they found some instances um, where teams didn't fully consider whether a, a child's disability would result in them being bullied and we need to really document in their IEPs if they are, um, have the potential of being bullied or they're vulnerable to that, there needs to be documentation. Isn't that a question at the end of the IEP <coughs> process or maybe the annual review where the, the parent is asked specifically if they feel their child is in danger of that or is that? No, no, um, I think every district does it a little different. Okay, so we, um, based yeah. Based on my daughter's yeah. experience. Yeah, and, uh, so everybody, every district does it a little different, but it is an, it's a 2010 <coughs> requirement. I mean, it's not brand new, but, um, and there was a form created to help <coughs> monitor this. So hmm. I don't know, Craig, if you want to talk about the civil rights. Um. I don't know if that would take time to talk about each, yeah. each one. Yeah. I mean, several of those, I, I think you have them in the packet. Yeah. Yeah. Several of those were actually um, some wordings that needed to change on some forms. And they were very easy mm -hmm. um, 
fixes. They just, some of the updated ones hadn't been submitted the year prior during that. A couple of them, though, are some things that we're looking at. I'm um, looking at some examples here. Um, things like um, some of our staff trainings that were updated. Yes, and some of yep. them, as we yep. said, the, the protected classes changed, so there was a different group. We needed to include gender identity in our training. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is just around that, making sure our processes were really addressing all of the protected class areas, because um, those change. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question. So you said the first thing you talked about, I think, was that they found that you we didn't do enough justification of the need to be in this separate setting. So it, but it wasn't, and maybe this wasn't a, the focus of the audit. Yeah. It wasn't that we had put kids into a separate setting and it was inappropriate. It no. was just that the justification, yes. the, sort of just the documentation. The way it was, yes. But um, now, did the the review didn't even include though an evaluation of whether it was good no, or bad? As I right said, or wrong. all they're it looking at compliance. what they're looking at is compliance. So the mm -hmm. documentation we have through their interviews with staff, are we in compliance with a pr the process that we're supposed to do? They're not looking at the quality of a program. They're not judging whether or not yeah, okay. we place kids appropriately in programs. That's really not their role. It's to say, are you in compliance with the process? Mm -hmm. So, and as you see in ELL, we only had one area um, that was partially implemented, which was just around the number of hours um, that we have been serving our students. Mr. Robles? So, <clears throat> just to, so these uh, partially implemented, or I guess what it, criticisms yeah. or whatever, uh, <laughs> are based on what we've done for the past three years? Yes. So, is that... I mean that doesn't look like a lot of no problems. this is this is really yeah. this is we're this in is, good shape this is good. Which is a was a very good report <clears throat> was a very it would be nice if they had a commendable in there yeah. but they don't operate that <laughs> they don't give a lot they do have that as an area but they don't give them out so you we got a lot of implemented so they can actually go on the uh, state website des a tesc -E website and see all of the different mm -hmm. school districts oh you can look at every school district and all of their yeah, and see all the different findings and all the different mm -hmm. districts yeah and I don't think any of these findings are uncommon no. to other districts. So. Mrs. Well, Broski? Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I think you might have said, uh, Craig, that some of them might have just been housekeeping mm -hmm. where we had a Yeah, get, there are yeah. several of those. Yeah. 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 Mrs. Broski? Thank you. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I, 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 read, the, I read the whole thing. And um, I agree with that assessment. It, a lot of these were very much you yeah. didn't update your language or yeah. this needs to be included. So it felt that way. Um, I'd like to ask you to go a little bit beyond this where you're kind of just getting into yeah. it. What, what are the, I'm so happy to hear you're collecting data. What are the things that you're looking for? Six, 12 months from now, what are gonna be the data that you're looking at to say we are on the right track in terms of how we um, do special education mm -hmm. in Reading? Well, I think for me is starting to look, and as a district leadership team, we're talking about that referral data and making sure that we're doing a good job with, we're required to do what's called child find. So are we finding those students who truly have disabilities and not just putting students through that evaluation process that I talked about who maybe, you know, have some weaknesses? But, you know, are we doing a good job with that? Are we putting together um, quality programming? So are the programs that I listed out for you and those supports, are they, is it that quality piece? Are we truly um, developing programs that are based on research-based methodologies that we're actually seeing results? So what are the data points that those teachers are saying, this is how I know my kids are making progress? And are we placing kids in those programs who really require that? level of programming. This is what. Thank you, Mr. Crusoe. So I have um, actually two questions, yeah. but so one of them is um, in with respect to the high school. So when I, I think about, and we had the elementary presentation, sort of the, the student support group where the teachers meet, but with respect to the high school, you know, how do you, um, there are there processes that just 
have you look at data or is it the guidance counselors? Like, where do you get that view? Because it could be a combination of data pieces on a high school student relating to attendance patterns yeah. and then um, per performance. And, you know, one classroom, they see an A student. Yeah. In the next classroom, mm -hmm. it's a D student. You know, and then there's this attendance pattern um, that might need to be looked at or I don't know, you know, they don't participate in the community or maybe they've been getting bullied. I don't know, what, whatever the different mm -hmm. things are. How do you, so how, how, how is that well, done the now? Different or is levels, that as, as Karen spoke about, they have the SST process and that's something that happens at all levels. Okay. How those teams are brought together and who is on those teams varies by level. So depending on, you know, at the high school level, they include guidance. They may include, they have a new um, general ed social worker. She might be part of that conversation. So they bring different people into that. But it's developing a, a, that more comprehensive process is something I would like to see strengthened so that we're making sure we're doing that consistently mm -hmm. and that we're capturing that piece. I mean, that's the work of the MTSS work that's happening. That's what we're trying to get these more systematic pieces where we're looking at the whole child and all these people are able to weigh in and look at the data and say okay here's what's happening and here are some interventions we can do before we say we need to refer to special ed mm -hmm. like how do we support those different learners one more sure. so where is the piece on the um we talked about the classrooms the separate the need for the separate k to two and three to five <coughs> Um, is that was that part of this review or they is did that review that and they did and when we had our meeting at the end of the process last February February uh, February yeah. 10th um, they they cited that to us as a major concern but they, they didn't, didn't capture it in this report which I don't understand yeah because they made sure they told us at the meeting yeah. which is why I was saying what I was saying last spring mm -hmm. Oh, well, they didn't necessarily I don't know they thought they were doing us but a that may not necessarily be tied to a compliance yeah, it issue. Been. Uh, Oh, oh, it might not be tied to a, a one of space. the well, there was, space it was piece. in there. There is a sighting. Uh, there's a one of the areas, but yeah. they didn't. But so maybe they, they thought they were they, being nice. Were. So, okay. So theoretically, I mean, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. We have three more years that we could get away with not having that. No, that's not because if we any time we would violate the 48 month rule we would be out of compliance yeah. whether they do a review or not but they didn't put it in their, their report is what you're saying right no 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 they didn't put anything in the report about space right but we always have to be we in compliance to, with the 48 yeah. months we can't extend that so that's where i say where our next steps are is that part of what they expect of us as a district is that we have ongoing monitoring to make sure we remain in compliance not with just those areas that we were cited on, but what are our systems for making sure we remain compliant with all of the areas? And one of those is the 48 month piece, that if we are going to have an instructional grouping that's greater than 48 months, that we're gonna apply for a waiver and that's only a temporary uh, request. They only give it to us for a year and we have to say how we're gonna fix that the following year. Oh, Mrs. Yeah. Drowski. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps a bit more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Um, the, of all of the citations, it was number 22 that most concerned me, so I'm, I would okay. just put that to you. And that had to yeah. do with communication to families of yeah. the inability. Yeah. Um, and the reason is because that has the potential to create long-term trust issues in yes. communication. So yeah. just as you're looking at this program going forward, I would, I would just ask that you <coughs> prioritize anything that has to do with building trust and communication with families. Mm -hmm. That would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. So really our next steps are we've submitted our corrective action plan, the department gave us some feedback, and our next steps are to do training with staff and to develop those systems for monitoring, and then they require us to do what's called a root cause analysis. So if we see issues in these areas that we're doing an analysis as to why this is happening and we can explain it to the department. And we have to submit progress reports um, to the department with different documentation showing that we're doing taking these steps to fix these situations so, so well, I didn't have you speak at all Carla that's fine <laughs> she just had to sit here for She's four my hours until, okay <laughs> were there other questions from the committee other questions from the audience thank this you was, and this was wonderful thank you thank very you. much thank you
Who does the clapping? Really? That's a positive. Before. Yeah. So All right, field trips. We will have, hey. Sorry. Oh, oh, go home. I'm still sitting here. I'm still <laughs> sitting here. Just for you. Um, <laughs> I, 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 this is where, but we're going to do uh, field trips. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Robinson, do you have any motions for field trips this evening? Uh, move to approve the Coolidge eighth grade field trip to Quebec in the spring of 2018. Second. Second. Dr. Doherty, uh, has, uh, have these field trips been vetted using our proposed yes. policy? Thank you very yes, much. Yes, I've met with both, uh, well, the, you're talking about Quebec right now. I met yes, with uh, Mrs. Klein, Mrs. Marchant, and went through the checklist with them, which I've included in the packet. Um, so, yes. Did we have a second on that motion? I apologize. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Were there questions from the committee? I am. Absolutely, Mr. Robinson. Uh, I had a, we, I think we talked, I can't I'm getting old too. Uh, the, on one of the field trips that Dr. Ryan's doing, mm -hmm. we, he sent out an email regarding, you know, the Ebola situation. <laughs> and I mean, that, that's something that's probably, I mean, that's, emanated since our last meeting really the seriousness right. of that mm -hmm. and how are we addressing that with like when students are getting on a plane to go to Quebec or no they're taking a bus okay. yeah it's a bus I mean like it, it would be any field trip I mean we would certainly be monitoring the situation whether it be the virus or whether it be some unrest in a, in a country um, and as a school committee and a superintendent, we have the right to to say you're not going on that field trip because it's not safe. Okay. Um, and I, the policy does have that um, in there um, that you know we would be monitoring it right up to the time that they're leaving. Dr. Doxer? Is there, um, I missed it if it was in here in terms of um, a recommended insurance, travel insurance program? For families, if they choose, you're talking about for the for this trip. The Quebec. Um, they they can purchase. I believe it's in the application. They can purchase. They can Sorry. purchase travel insurance. They can. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Further discussion? I can't see down there. No. Great. Uh, ready for a vote? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries. Six of us. Six zero. Move to approve the seventh grade. Uh, Coolidge seventh grade field trip to nature's classroom in April 2015. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Doherty, again, the same question. This has I been did. I, our I, process. I met with um, Ms. Anderson and Mr. Coyne um, and Mrs. Marchant uh, on this trip, and you know, I'm Thank very satisfied very with the Prindle Pond is something we've been doing for over 20 years now. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Uh, we have minutes. Uh, actually, we have we donations. Have donations. Um, move to accept the <coughs> donation, the amount of $1,000 from the RMHS PTO to be used to support the purchase of materials for the RMHS library. Is there a second? Second. second. Dr. Jordy, a comment? No. No, I have a Not comment yep. about another donation. Okay, great. Oh, I think uh, we thank the RMHS PTO. Um, it's in the memo. Right. It's in the memo. Okay. Great. Um, if there's no further discussion on this particular motion, all those in favor of expect accepting the generous gift? Mrs. Webb is raising her hand. I feel it. <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Uh, we have minutes. We have minutes. Is there another motion, uh, Dr. Doherty? Is there another donation for us to look at? No. Great. Just no. wanted to make sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Move, Robinson. Move to approve the financial forum minutes dated September 10th, 2014. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? Move. Motion carries 6 0. Go for it. Move to approve the open session minutes dated April 6th, 2014. Is, is I mean, October <laughs> Is there a second? Second. second? Thank you. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. I abstained for the record. Uh, I apologize. Thank you, Mrs. Move Wood. to adjourn. Right. I, I, 
That's okay. Uh, before I entertain that motion to adjourn, uh, Dr. Doherty, did you have a comment? Um, yes. Yeah, the, the only thing is, um, with the postponement of the two policies tonight, we'll have to talk ab about, because uh, there were a couple um, citizens that asked when we were going to do those, and I told them that I would send something out. Sure. Once. You and I will figure out the agenda together, and we'll put that. Um, I did want to mention our next meeting as a committee is next Wednesday. No, Correct. Is it next Wednesday night? Yes, the financial October forum. October 29th, financial forum next Wednesday night. Please let me know if you're unable to attend. Um, attendance would be really appreciated. Great. Awesome. Mr. Robinson? Do you have anything you want to moved. say? Moved. Oh. Mr. Uh, oh, sure. Robinson moved to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 6-0.